Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your sommelier of sci-fi, <laughs> your viceroy of verisimilitude, and your master of fun and wonder, and your existential Mr. Rogers. Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Of course, I did let the dogs in today. Tallulah? Tallulah? Okay, fine. You want to you you do the, the deal? I get it. Come on up. Come on up. There you go. You want to be seen? Hang on. Hang on, everybody. Uh, you know, you know, you've missed the dogs, so I decided to let the dogs in today. You coming in? You coming up or what? Oh, there you coming up. You both gonna come up? Uh oh, uh oh. No, uh, <laughs> no, Gilbert. You get stuck here. You wanna come up too? Come on, come on. There you go, buddy. I know everybody likes to see you, huh? Yeah, that's right, buddy. Yes, oh yes. Here, you get another one, too. Here, you have another cookie. Came in from under the desk. People are going to think unclean thoughts. Yes, buddy. Okay, now you got to get down. Good boy. All right. Where was I? <laughs> well, they, I know people have been saying, where's Gilbert and Tallulah? Well, now you know. I let them on the show today. I figured, why not? Let's hope they'll be less rambunctious than they've been in the past. Anyway, welcome to Rob Observations, the show about something. This is Rob Observations, episode number three. 143 my god it's a friday and uh it's great to be back with you no Lula. she's gonna have to uh she's gonna have to be quiet Tallulah's in heat uh elizabeth wants to breed her and uh i i would like to get her spayed but yeah oh well, she doesn't want that <laughs> anyway so first of all uh i want to talk about something I, I watch YouTube. I watch a lot of YouTube, and one of the things and uh, that I love to watch is Joe Rogan. And I know it's the the video portion of Joe Rogan is basically just a video. Uh, his podcast is the main thing, but I really enjoy his podcast a great deal. And there are sometimes there are people on his podcast that I make the mistake of jumping on like at midnight. You know, I'm going to sample what somebody's going to say. I'll just jump on and. I'm like, all right, I'll check this person out. Well, on the 19th of February, there was uh, I, uh, there was a guy on the podcast, a guy on the podcast that I could not. That's it, you guys, you you greedy, you greedy canines. Uh, there was a guy on the podcast I could not stop watching. Couldn't stop watching. I, and his name, let me show you his name and his brand new book is this. Brian Green. Brian Green uh, wrote the book Until the End of Time. And according to the Joe Rogan podcast, Brian Green is a theoretical physicist, mathematician, and string theorist. He's been a professor at Columbia University since 1996 and chairman of the World Science Festival since co founding it in 2008. This is his new book that has just come out. I have to tell you, first of all, very amiable, very uh, seemingly approachable guy that I could not stop listening to. And I was up, all, not all night, but what? Well, how long is this podcast? It was two and a half hours long. So it, I was riveted till, you know, 2.30 in the morning or something. And I we had to get up early and, and all that. And I, I, I was blown away by him. And what was really interesting was not only was he sort of quantifying the state of the universe, which I can never get enough of. It was just fascinating to listen to. But he started talking about uh, the meeting, the, the, the meeting place of both science and religion. And I would have expected him to dismiss religion, which he did not do. And as a matter of fact, he, he gave a very compelling reason why religion, uh, which is it also is akin to human creativity, why religion and religious belief can be vital to human existence. And the whole thing was just unbelievable. And I, I, I just, I wanted to read a little bit from his uh, introduction. This is the preface from his book, Brian Greene. And again, I implore you all, it's the Joe Rogan show that was on February 19th. I implore you all to watch the podcast. I hope you find it as riveting as I did, because just fascinating stuff. This is from his preface. I do mathematics because once you prove a theorem, it stands forever. The statement, simple and direct, was startling. 
I was a sophomore in college and had mentioned to an older friend who for years had taught me vast areas of mathematics that I was writing a paper on human motivation for a psychology course I was taking. His response was transformative. Until then, I hadn't thought about mathematics in terms of even remotely similar. To me, math was a wondrous game of abstract precision played by a particular community who would delight at punchlines, turning on square roots, or dividing by zero. But with his remark, the cogs suddenly clicked. Yes, I thought, that is the romance of mathematics. Creativity constrained by logic and a set of axioms dictates how ideas can be manipulated and combined to reveal unshakable truths. Every right-angled triangle drawn from before Pythagoras and on to eternity satisfies the famous theorem that bears his name. There are no, no exceptions. Sure, you can change the assumptions and find yourself exploring new realms, such as triangles drawn on curved surface like the skin of a basketball, which can upend Pythagoras' conclusion. But fix your assumptions, double-check your work, and your result is ready to be chiseled in stone. No climbing to the mountaintop, no wandering the desert, no triumphing over the underworld. You can sit comfortably at a desk and use paper, pencil, and a penetrating mind to create something timeless. As does say an author. The perspective opened my world. I had never really asked myself why I was so deeply attracted to mathematics and physics. Solving problems, learning how the universe is put together, that's what had always captivated me. I now became convinced that I was drawn to these disciplines because they hovered above the impermanent nature of the everyday. However overblown my youthful sensibilities rendered my commitment, I was suddenly sure I wanted to be part of a journey toward insights so fundamental that they would never change. Let governments rise and fall. Let World Series be won and lost. Let legends of film, television, and stage come and go. I wanted to spend my life catching a glimpse of something transcendent. In the meantime, I still had that psychology paper to write. The assignment was to develop a theory of why humans do what we do. But each time I started writing, the project seemed decidedly nebulous. If you clothe reasonable-sounding ideas in the right language, it seemed you could pretty much make it up as you went along. I mentioned this over dinner at my dorm, and one of the resident advisors suggested I take a look at Oswald Spengler's Decline of the West. A German historian philosopher, Spengler had an abiding interest in both mathematics and science, no doubt the very reason his book had been recommended. The aspects responsible for the book's fame and scorn, predictions of political implosion, a veiled espousal of fascism, are deeply troubling and have since been used to support insidious ideologies. But I was too narrowly focused for any of this to register. Instead, I was intrigued by Spengler's vision of an all-encompassing set of principles that would reveal hidden patterns playing out across disparate cultures on par with the patterns articulated by calculus and Euclidean geometry that had transformed understanding in physics and mathematics. Spengler was talking my language. It was inspiring for a text on history to revere math and physics as a template for progress. But then came an observation that caught me thoroughly by surprise. Man is the only being that knows death. All others become old, but with a consciousness wholly limited to the moment, which must seem to them eternal. Knowledge that instills the essentially human fear in the presence of death, Spengler concluded that every religion, every scientific investigation, every philosophy proceeds from it. I remember dwelling on that last line. Here was a perspective on human motivation that made no sense to me, or that made sense to me. The enchantment of a mathematical proof might be that it stands forever. The appeal of a law of nature might be its timeless quality. But what drives us to seek the timeless? To search for qualities that may last forever? Perhaps it all comes from our singular awareness that we are anything but timeless that our lives are anything but forever. Resonating with my newfound thinking on math, physics, and the allure of eternity, this felt on target. It was an approach to human motivation grounded in a plausible reaction to a pervasive recognition. It was an approach that didn't make it up on the fly. As I continued to think about this conclusion, it seemed to promise something grander still. Science, as Spengler noted, 
is one response to the knowledge of our inescapable end. And so is religion. And so is philosophy. But really, why stop there? According to Otto Rank, an early disciple of Freud who was fascinated by the human creative process, we surely shouldn't. The artist, in Rank's assessment, is someone whose creative impulse attempts to turn ephemeral life into personal immortality. Jean-Paul Sartre went further, noticing that life itself is drained of meaning when you have lost the illusion of being eternal. The suggestion then, threading its way through these and other thinkers who followed, is that much of human culture, from artistic exploration to scientific discovery, is driven by life reflecting on the finite nature of life. Deep Waters, who knew that a preoccupation with all things mathematics and physics would tap into visions of a unified theory of human civilization driven by the rich duality of life and death. Well, anyway, he goes on. Now, I found this fascinating, and he... Um, I've kind of always thought that myself, that the entire purpose of the arts is to make sense, just like science fiction itself, of our, our lives in our confused state of knowledge. Kind of, I'm paraphrasing Brian Aldiss, the science fiction writer right there, but I've always kind of believed that, that we tell stories, we, we, we indeed, to, to make sense of not just our own lives, but the, the lives of all humanity. And I think the great stories, even if somebody, what do I say at the end of every episode? Every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. All you have to do is listen. And I honestly believe that because every single person has a story. And I'm always quipping to my friends. I'm always going, well, if, you know, if you're not going to write your own story, if you're not going to have your own personal mythology that you're going to put forward, who's going to do it for you? Now, sure, you might be famous enough that someone's going to write a biography about you one day. But while you're moving through life, you have to write your own story. You have to create your own tale that you can, you can tell people. I was talking with somebody uh, earlier today, a, a friend of mine, an old friend of mine, a person that uh, I actually, she, a person, she's a myth mythological figure in my life, actually. When I first saw her, I didn't even believe she existed. I really thought I was seeing an apparition, and uh, it was in high school, and I, I actually asked people, I said, have you, uh, this person was, was absolutely, you could not miss her, I mean, she was striking, and, and for various reasons, but uh, it was, I didn't, uh, nobody could confirm that she existed, and there was a point in my life where I actually thought this person wasn't real, <laughs> but maybe at that moment, she turned into a mythological figure, she's convinced I completely, um, I, I've completely mythologized her out of out of all out of all reality, but that's not true. I would dare say she doesn't mythologic mytho, mythologize. What do you want? She she <laughs> she's a cynic, so she's she's never she's never uh, mythologized herself the way I mythologize her. But it was very interesting. She's also a huge Star Trek fan, <laughs> so that's that's all good. And but I think it's important. Why? What is it with these dogs? See, this is why I haven't been letting them in, everybody. Um, I know, Gilbert. I know, buddy. I know. They just want attention. Um, but I think it's important that there's an element of, of your own life that you should mythologize. You should mythologize yourself. Even if it's only to yourself and you don't, you don't tell anybody else. You know, like I, I admitted when, when I was on the, the episode a couple, a couple weeks back with Colleen, my biological sister, that it was fun when I was adopted to think that I was some alien prince that was secreted away on, on Earth to be kept safe from some galactic civil war. I was my own Kwisat Tsarak. I was my own Paul Atreides. And I used to believe that. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe somewhere deep down inside, I probably still do. And is there anything wrong with that? I don't necessarily think that there is. But that brings me to something else I was thinking about as I was, I was listening to Brian Green talk. I was thinking about as I'm reading comments on the 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 um, the comments section of, of this very this very YouTube page, and I um, a lot of people, well, in fan circles, of course, the last couple of years, three or four years, actually, have been very divisive. 
Um, there has been there's the fra- the fan base is fractured. People love things, people hate things, and I of course have been very emphatic uh, as to my hatred of Star Trek for f- the last eleven years. As a matter of fact, my friend that I was talking to today said. Oh, it was beautiful. Fuck J.J. Abrams. <laughs> That's why she's a mythological figure in my life. But one of the one of the 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 things that I was thinking about as I was watching Brian Green last night on Joe Rogan is that I think I think we as fans, as we argue on Twitter and Reddit and whatever, wherever it is that we're having these long arguments, that it's important to remember. That whatever it is that you love, whatever it is that you love, I don't care. Like my dad and my brother Jim, my older brother Jim, are very in. We're very into Jim still is into horse racing. Uh, my brother Jim published the Oregon Horse. He was the editor of the Oregon Horse Magazine for a decade. My father loved horse racing. In a way, in my family, I guess my mother's religion was golf, but so was my father's. But my dad also loved horse racing. I never understood it. I liked going out to Long Acres, which was a racetrack we had in outside of Seattle, and I enjoyed going to the racetrack with my father. I enjoyed going to Turf Paradise with him in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, up until shortly before he passed away. And he was like the Yoda uh, when he would go into the clubhouse there. People would, would come over and want to consult with him. But But I was thinking about fandom and how... Like, uh, my, my vehement dislike of modern Star Trek uh, should not have any bearing on people that like modern Star Trek. Because everybody likes what they like, especially I'll use Star Trek as an example, in a different way. Like, I take Star Trek really seriously. Some would say way too seriously. And that was because when I was a kid, um, it was this, I mean, the way some people probably discuss Greek mythology or art history or something, my thing that I, I was studying was this fictional universe that didn't exist. And even as a child, when I would read the Best of Trek anthologies, which was basically, for those of you who don't know, the Best of Trek, which I have them all over here, was they were paperback anthologies that collected articles from a fanzine called The Best of Trek, or Trek. Trek was the name of the the magazine, so this was The Best of Trek, and I think there was almost 20 of them. And I would read these, and they were just essays written by, you know, fans. Not necessarily people with any kind of academic credentials like Brian Greene, but, I mean, I don't know, other than my, my good buddy Tom Parham, who teaches at Azusa Pacific University, who wrote his PhD thesis on Star Trek, which I think is now available. You can actually purchase it. I mean, how cool is that? Tom Parham, Professor Parham, <laughs> wrote his doctoral thesis on Star Trek. I mean, come on, people. But I, you know, I took it really seriously, and I, I, I always have. Whether I've talked a lot about how the Star Trek blueprints or the Star Trek encyclopedia, by the way, the Akuta's two volume, the re-release of that that came out a couple of years ago is essential and it needs to be on anyone's bookshelf. Mine is right over there. And, uh, you know, whether it was the Star Trek space flight chronology that came out in the wake of Star Trek, the motion picture or Lemmy, Larry Nemechek's Lemmy, Larry Nemechek's Star Trek star charts book uh, uh, with actual star charts. I mean, uh, I have spent an inordinate amount of time uh, in my life thinking about the Star Trek universe. And I have very particular notions of what I personally believe that Star Trek should be. Now, my friend Adrian Iscaria, who produced the Hitman movies, we always go back and forth, and we were doing that right before I went on the show, where he was talking about Star Trek Picard, and how he's really enjoying Star Trek Picard, and he he tweeted at me and had to get that dig in. We've been going back and forth about Star Trek The Motion Picture for for years now, and um, actually, to his credit, he watched Star Trek The Motion Picture again recently and said, you know what? This movie is pretty good. <laughs> so I felt, okay, good for him. <laughs> Jeez, I'm bringing him back from the dark side. But what I realized, and what I was thinking about as I was listening to Brian Green talk about not just mathematics and, and string theory, but, but also religion and, and stories that we tell, is that 
what's going on in fandom, you know, uh, even me who who wants to yell and scream at people for I'm like, how can you like Star Trek the way it is now? How can you like this? Well, they don't like Star Trek the way I like Star Trek. And I'm sure they're not looking to get the same things out of Star Trek that I'm looking to get out of them. And it's not because I'm old. Well, perhaps it is. It's not because I'm old. It, it's it's just because how I've approached... I mean, I, my approach to Star Trek, if I was old, I must have been the oldest uh, five-year-old in the world because I approach Star Trek as a five-year-old very, very seriously. Right, Gilbert? What are you barking so much for? Why? I mean, I think it's interesting these dogs come in and they uh, they think when I'm talking, I'm probably talking to them. But that's not true, is it, buddy? Oh, now Tallulah's here. They're both here. But I think it's they're going to probably start barking again. Um, it's kind of been nice. I mean, I love the dogs, but it's kind of nice not having them here. But so anyway, in the wake of, of The Last Jedi and in the wake of of the the these three seasons of, of Star Trek that have really been... Hey, you guys, how about no? How about no, Tallulah? I know. These dogs... Look, if I give you a cookie, we look, they're so... I know, it looks. it just looks bad. Who's trained? Me? Or the dogs, but they have been here, so I'm giving them a Friday. So, but I, it really got me thinking that even though I am, I'm constantly, I don't know, railing on the, the the state of Star Trek. Does that mean people that are coming to Star Trek? I've even said people who are coming to Star Trek for the first time. If Picard is their first experience with Star Trek, or Star Trek 09 was, or or Star, God forbid, Star Trek Into Darkness. Who am I to to take that away from somebody? And uh, if they like it, they like it. And I, I, I'm the first person to say, if you like something, you should be able to like it. You know, you shouldn't have to apologize for what you like. You shouldn't. You shouldn't be getting in fights with people who don't like something. And I think one of the things about Star Wars is that. A lot of Star Wars fans, unlike Star Trek, the people that really love Star Wars, that they they've been they've paid as much attention to Star Wars as I've paid to Star Trek. There's a lot of, uh, I guess you'd call them fundamentalist fans, like like myself, and Star Wars probably occupied. And Star Wars was a big deal for me too, but to be honest, I I sort of tuned out of Star Wars after Jedi. Star Wars and Empire meant the world to me, but when we got to Return of the Jedi. Uh, it was so disappointing to me that I um, I sort of tuned out because I realized while I, I liked a lot of what was in Return of the Jedi overall, it was to me a crushing disappointment. So my uh, Star Wars left. And at the same time, Star Trek was going on. And after when Return of the Jedi came out, we were only a summer away. We were an, uh, a, a year away from the release that, of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. It was still resonating very deeply. And I had I'd obviously bought the pre-recorded video cassette and was watching it over and over and over again, and it was it was very interesting. Becoming sixteen and learning how to drive, I started to drive right before Return of the Jedi opened, and so I went through you know rite of passage. And for me, when Return of the Jedi came out, I was expecting to have it speak to me in in a way that Star Wars and Empire did because. Empire came out literally days before my bar mitzvah, when I became a man in the Jewish tradition, and it really resonated with me at the time, and I was expecting that Return of the Jedi would have as much to say to me as a 16-year-old as Empire Strikes Back did when I was 13, and unfortunately it didn't. Return of the Jedi didn't have much to say to me at all. There was not much for me to ponder. I did enjoy the the final scene of course, in the Emperor's throne room, from a visceral standpoint, it seemed like a great ending to the trilogy, but the rest of the movie didn't resonate with me. Whether you liked what was going on on Dagobah or whether you liked what was happening when Han Solo found out his best friend had sold him out and what went on in Cloud City, it was all of those messages, whatever they were, I don't need to analyze them now, but they really spoke to me when I was 13, and I was expecting that that same thing would happen, but it didn't. However, Star Trek II was still there, resonating with me as I passed that other great rite of passage when you're a teenager, getting your driver's license. 
and learning how to drive and actually meeting the person that I told you was a mythological figure in my life. All of these things were sort of um, happening at, uh, and they resonated all together. You know, and, and Star Trek was something that had been in my life since I was a five-year-old kid. And even now, you know, as a middle-aged man with one foot in his grave, I am still watching and contemplating Star Trek. And it's, I find on one hand, I might really despise what has been done with modern Star Trek. But even that, even in my vehement hatred of the last decade of Star Trek, even that allows me to reflect back on where, where am I in my life now? What matters to me? What still matters to me? And I might not like what's going on with Star Trek. I might wonder, why does a show that apparently wants to consider itself so woke would give us a story about a black woman who's an addict and a deadbeat mother? Why did that seep into the story? You know, that's literally living in a trailer. <laughs> and and it's funny, these are things that will be written as part of op-ed pieces as I think the show goes on. But... I that was something else I really didn't talk about it yesterday in um, my initial analysis of Star Trek Picard but I found that whole side story baffling uh, why in a science fiction action adventure show where a ticking clock has is ticking down are we gonna take a side story and and, and a skirt an excursion where our, our character turns out to be not only a drug addict not only has squandered the last 20 years of her life but is also a deadbeat mother, which is probably the storyline of 200,000 episodes of television over the last 50 years. And that's what, we've, that's what was put in Star Trek. So I can say that, yep, here's another, here's another uh, uh, stupid, inane, unoriginal, uncreative element that they've had to... Tallulah, no. Yeah, listener. I wish you could hear her vocalizations. She's making me give her more cookies just to shut her up. But I, it is, it is, it is baffling to me that where Star Trek is. But as I was listening to Brian Green last night, I was thinking, you know what though? It's kind of made me take stock in my own life and where is my personal mythology now? Where am I at as a fan, as a human being? What is it that I still believe in? And as far as I mean, Star Trek is doing its very best to completely destroy everything that made it important to me as both a young child, a teenager, a young adult, and a middle-aged man. Now, what I loved about Star Trek isn't going away. You can't take it away. Tallulah, you're really, you're really not um, endearing yourself to me. But it, it's not going away. But it's unfortunate that, that I think what I liked about Star Trek, that in, what inspired me, I think has been bled out of Star Trek, and that's why I it's distressing to me. But for other people, for people that are coming to Star Trek for the first time, um, it's speaking to them. You know, it's it's something that that they're clearly um, thinking about, and and obviously we can go back and forth on Twitter and talk about who's right and who's wrong. Uh, what's distressing though is to think that they're not getting. Star Trek was always aspirational to me. And I don't, I see that first and foremost, the thing that I find most distressing about Star Trek is that the uplifting aspirations of what I got out of the show seem to be gone. And maybe that's what I object to the most. But then again, maybe the people that are watching Star Trek now that are really embracing Discovery or embracing Picard are getting something out of it that is aspirational. Um, I don't see what that could possibly be, but it really isn't for me to say. You know, it's not for me. It's who am I to come out and say, I've never believed in the term gatekeeping. I don't, I don't agree with that because nobody is keeping you from anything. I mean, I haven't built any kind of a barrier between you and what you love. If I want to be critical about something, come back at me. It's, it's very funny because I've noticed that um, there are some people that, are, that are, come back with thoughtful thoughtful things but when you say you don't like something there's a great deal of people that'll come back and make it personal about you i try not to do that 
sometimes I might be guilty and, and uh, I don't live up to what I would like to live up to, but hey, uh, nobody's perfect, right? So, you know, I'm just curious, like, what do you guys think? What, what, are, what are some of the things, what do you believe? Do you allow people to, to get in the way of your enjoyment of things? If somebody tells you that, hey, um, I don't like what you like, does it affect your, I mean, obviously it's tough. We all as human beings want to be able to, we all want to be able to uh, um, commiserate or, or talk to people that share our points of view, but we don't want to be criticized. And I think that it's, it's just, it's really, it's really making me think. I mean, what, I think people were disillusioned by the portrayal of Luke Skywalker. Like I was no longer attached to Star Wars the way I used to be. So I can look at The Last Jedi and, and, and I can take enjoyment out of it because I found it interesting. Now there's a lot of people that felt that The Last Jedi besmirched the character of Luke. And I don't necessarily think those people are wrong. Um, and why they're why why they're upset uh, is part of the reason why Star Trek Picard upsets me. I feel like Star Trek Picard, uh, Picard is the character of Picard is is people are like, well, he's old now. Well, I think the character of Picard has been completely neutered. I think he's he's I I really don't understand the characterization or the portrayal, and I don't I don't understand why every other character that meets him berates him. You know, and I won't go sorry. Look, the female characters absolutely, uh, but and and that is I just chalk that up to overcompensation in our in our culture. It's something we're going to have to deal with for a while, but it's it's not whether it's female characters that are berating him. It's anybody that's berating him. Um, I th I think that there is a fundamental lack of respect in our culture. There's a fundamental lack of respect for children who um, make fun of adults. You know, and I I my, I, I call it my Bart Simpson theory. I think that with the advent of of Bart Simpson, um, what thirty years ago now, and then we saw a shift because of Bart Simpson. I blame Bart Simpson. I'm probably wrong. Somebody will come at me for this, but this is my own theory. Then we saw the rise of of Disney Channel shows and Nickelodeon shows where the kids were the smartest people on the show, and the adults were the clueless idiots. Well, when I was a kid, that wasn't the case. The sitcoms that I grew up watching after school, whether it was Leave it to Beaver or My Three Sons or even Brady Bunch and the Partridge Family, these were the things that were staples of the of the time. You'd come home from school and there was like a block of three hours where these shows were on before the news started at six and you'd watch them. I'd come home and drink a glass of milk and eat some Oreo cookies and watch these shows. And in those shows, it was always the adults that knew what was up and the kids would make mistakes. And they would bond with their parents, admitting their mistakes, and you would learn a lesson. And that was true of Leave it to Beaver in the 50s, and it was true of My Three Sons, and all the way into the late 60s and early 70s with Brady Bunch and then Partridge Family. So, you know, for about 25 years of American pop culture history, and, and what was interesting, the rise of the middle class gave rise, you had television shows and, you know, Leave it to Beaver. If there was, if there was a, a show that I think defined my childhood, which probably also defined the middle class and the time it was made, it was Leave it to Beaver. You know, and you even had the smarmy Eddie Haskell. So it wasn't like everybody was a saint. And, and then suddenly in, in the, the advent of, 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 with the Simpsons, a lot of things changed. And suddenly the, the, the balance of power shifted to children. And all of this, I mean, this is for sociologists or, or media, more media savvy pundits than me can write these, they can write their college thesis on this, they get their PhDs on, on how media and the media landscape has changed. And with the advent of, of the internet technology and our supercomputers that we carry around in our pockets. Anyway, I guess I'm probably rambling. I don't know. Let's see what you guys have to say, if anyone's even here. <laughs> Is anyone still listening to me? <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, uh, we'll see um, what is up with everyone. So um, let me click on and see. So uh, I go back. Hang on. I'm going to have to put my glasses back on. I apologize for that. Um, and boy, let me wipe them on because I touch them with my fingers. So, yeah, you know, as you can see, I, I, I was looking for some great sci-fi media topic to discuss. But I don't know. You know, I keep thinking about Brian Greene and his appearance on Rogan. Um, 
so uh, Robert, Roberto Suarez sent in a tip and said, The Expanse knows what it is. Picard knows what The Expanse is, as well as Battlestar Galactica, Blade Runner, Firefly, and Alien. It just doesn't know what Star Trek is. Well, Roberto, I think you're probably right about that. That's a very astute way of looking at things, and I don't disagree with you. Yeah, that's another thing I find about Star Trek Picard and Star Trek Discovery is they're drawing from other things and not so much Star Trek, and it's quite frankly maddening. Uh, Jason S. tipped sent a tip and said, I know movie studios take out loans to make movies, but when a huge movie flops like Cats, how do they pay back those loans? By profits of future hit movies, or do they default on the loan and the company they set up for that project goes bankrupt? No. The reason uh, movie studios would never let their projects go bankrupt like that because they have to go back to those lenders all the time. Their entire business model. Remember, movies, movie studios have multiple projects in production all the time. I think Disney now says that they're going to release eight major movies a year. And if you look at what Disney is making, most of their movies, you're looking between anywhere from $150 million to even $300 million budget, somewhere in that range. And all of those movies have to be borrowed. So if you think about eight of those movies, I mean, if there's going to be eight of them, you're looking at Disney needs to be able to borrow $2.4 million, what, a year? That's just to make just to make their films. There's also overhead. They have to keep things going, paying people, payroll. They've got all kinds of other businesses. So the last thing that movie studios want to do is default on their loans and go bankrupt because no one's going to loan them movies. So what they do is, yes, a movie studio, if a movie does not do well, like Cats, and turns into an unmitigated disaster, they then have to make that up with the box office grosses or income that they make in other places. And um, that you should take keep that in mind when everyone thinks that everyone's uh, in Hollywood's getting rich all the time the the margins on even a movie like Endgame or Infinity War are not as large as you might think they are those margins just aren't as big as you might think Willow sent in a tip and said, I've never thought about the origins of xenomorphs because the answer is obviously evolution xenomorphs are basically just alien wasps and we are the caterpillars yes but um what was what was interesting i i would tend to agree with you willow but i think again in the original alien what was so wonderful about that movie was it really the same way that hp lovecraft writes about cthulhu and the old ones and the creatures that are living out there beyond our ability to comprehend that at any one moment are going to tear through the fabric of reality and come get us there was an element of that in the original Alien um, where it was unknowable. Like, we didn't know. We were never going to know where the derelict alien spacecraft came from. We're never going to know who the space jockey was. We were never going to know why he's carrying thousands of aliens with with face huggers inside. Where were they going? How were they allowed to? I mean, that was... The, but now, after Prometheus and Alien Covenant... They seem to have demystified all of that and explained, not only explained away potentially where humanity came from, but where the aliens themselves came from and were sort of linked together. And, and I find that demystification really disheartening. Because one of the things about Brian Greene, uh, when you start listening to him and you start wrestling with the, intellectually wrestling with the concepts that he's dealing with, the, the, the cosmic unknowability for us, the unknowability of the universe. And he, when he starts talking about time and particles and what it all means, it's so beyond our comprehension, really. And even, even listening to him talk, I had to, I had to stop myself. And I, I found myself stopping the, the live stream, well, the stream, and just for moments at a time contemplating what he was just saying, just so I could sort of wrap my head around it all. And it was, I, I, I was completely riveted by it all. But I think now with Alien Covenant and Prometheus, it's like all of that has been demystified. And they, they sort of, you know, they embrace this Eric Von Donegan, Chariots of the Gods business, ancient astronauts and all that. And it, 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 again, we've seen it before, but there was no profundity to it. It all became so ordinary. And while admittedly, 
Prometheus is one of the most beautiful science fiction movies ever made, but it's also the, one of the most monumentally brain dead as well. A group of scientists that aren't good at their jobs. A, a group of scientists that are actually all pretty dumb. You know, when I, when I was a kid, when I was growing up, I remember seeing one of the one of the scariest movies when I was a kid was I would watch a lot of 70s science fiction. And I don't know if any of you have seen The Andromeda Strain based on Michael Crichton's book. But it's basically about an extraterrestrial plague that that descends to Earth on a satellite, and it has dire effects on Earth. And I remember the opening of that movie, man. It was terrifying to me. I was so, as a little kid, I was so scared because it, I, you know, I was old enough to understand. I was a little precocious to understand the ramifications of what it was telling me. And the opening of that movie, man. Oh, and I, I love stories like that. Perhaps. You know, now that I think about it, I love stories about plagues and disease vectoring. And um, the, there's a there's an author, I believe he still lives in Portland. His name's Pierre Oulette. Oulette? Oulette? Pierre Oulette? Uh, I have his book right up there. But he wrote this great book, uh, again, uh, a, a, a plague book about a virulent plague. And I love virulent plague stories. And his book, The Third Pandemic, Um you know, on one hand, it was a horror novel about this plague outbreak. But what I loved about that book was that each chapter, at least in the early going, would begin from the third person perspective, talking about the mutating virus as if the mutating virus was actually a character in the book. And it would explain how one virus was passed on to another and it would mutate like a sex worker got it and because of her coupling with somebody else it mutated further and it was just it was it was something i always remembered i don't if i went back and read the book uh, again i don't know if i would think it, it was the greatest book in the world but that the the portrayal of a virus mutating as a character and i love that he just celebrated he's a facebook friend and he just celebrated his birthday i don't know what that has to do with anything but uh there you go han should have stayed dead tipped a dollar thanks for that han should have stayed dead uh, Sam O'Neill sent in a super chat saying, uh, do I recall you talking about the snow piercer with Chris Evans a few weeks back? Yes. If so, you did. If so, I bloody love that movie. If not, I recommend that movie. Ha ha. Well, for those of you who don't know, Bong Joon-ho, who just won the Best Directing Academy Award for directing Parasite, directed a post-apocalyptic movie called Snowpiercer that they've had problems getting the TV series done, but it's getting made. And it is a science fiction film based on a graphic novel where the uh, all that remains of society exists on this train that keeps traveling around the world that's become a frozen wasteland, and the train will never stop. It's a train that can go all the way around the world, and it's all about the the people that live on the train. And it's you know it's it's a uh, it's a culture war story. The the rich people live in the front of the train. The less rich people live in the back of the train. And it's quite, and Chris Evans is in it. Uh, there's a lot of other people. Tilda Swinton is in it. And it is a, it's a fantastic movie. It's not for everybody, but uh, it's just a very interesting look at uh, a dystopian future human civilization. Timbula the Spider Monkey. Tim is here from Australia, from Down Under. He's the man from Down Under. I just can't. As much as I love Star Trek, I don't think I can watch anymore. I don't need to spend an hour a week getting angry. I said before that I hated Discovery, but Picard had the potential to be so much more disappointing. And Star Trek is truly dead to me. Well, Tim, I don't, I, you know, I feel your pain, man. I do. I feel your pain. I wish that I, I, I wanted to love it. But they, the, the creative team that they have in place, I, I just don't think is capable of creating. They, the, you know what? They're, they're not original. Akiva Goldsman has always tended to dumb down the genre properties that he's working on. He is, he's very much a, yeah, I know he won his Academy Award for what? Writing a Beautiful Mind, where he had an adaptation, a book to adapt. But in terms of his genre, he, he always, his genre material, he always goes, the, he takes the easiest route, the simplest route. And it's frustrating. It's frustrating. I wish, you know, I wish that everybody who works on Star Trek would read Brian Greene's book because the concepts that he deals with could fill an entire season of Star Trek and they would be far more interesting than what we're getting now. 
Richard sends, sends in a tip and says, I like the latest episode, but probably revealed Seven's character wasn't destroyed, at least as much as Picard's character. I feel your issues with the show, like the Romulan political situation, are a bit of a nitpick. Our old, modern Trek shows were never clear on which empires were even next to each other. Could the Klingons even launch an invasion of Cardassia? That said, I began each show with low expectations because because Picard himself has been irredeemably damaged. Remember, there are four lights, or literally laughing in the face of death. Picard is a character of superhuman will and grim duty. He might seem cosmopolitan on the surface, but look deeper. Did Kurtzman? Sorry for the three T's. Well, Richard, that's a good... You know, a lot of people have said that I've been nitpicking. But here's the thing. When you are watching something, science fiction, you, you great science fiction or great storytelling in general, you can infer certain realities about the universe that you're dealing with. And when we first met the Romulans in Balance of Terror, they not only do they show us, do they tell us about the Romulans that we'd never heard of because it was Star Trek's early days, um, they told us a lot of things in that episode, that Romulans are an offshoot of Vulcans that we still have people who are deeply suspect, and especially when presented with physical evidence, at least visual evidence, that Romulans and Vulcans basically look exactly alike. You could deal with prejudice in that way. Now, that didn't seem like... What was great about that is they deal with prejudice, but there was very there was very good reason why Stiles felt that way, because he had family that fought in the Romulan War. Now, I get it. I totally understand some of that. I mean, I get family histories and all that, but they even show us a map and they establish a Romulan neutral zone and you don't know the actual entire layout of the Federation, but you do understand enough. You understand that at some point in space, there is a border. There is a border with the Romulan Empire. Now, one of the things they never really established in Star Trek either is, you know, you have the ecliptic plane of the, of the Milky Way, but, you know, like how far up do things go like if you have a neutral zone here and here and you can't travel between the two or whatever how far does that neutral zone go up you know <laughs> i mean space is obviously three-dimensional does it go up a couple uh, does it go up thousands of light years or whatever how what is the definition there but you don't necessarily need to know they give you just enough so you can uh, extrapolate upon what we know now about borders and things like that. But, it, you know, it doesn't get into it because that would be, you, you don't want to bog down your story, but you know enough. You know, you're given enough. So if somebody in a story tells you that D, uh, E, F, and G are, are in your story, D, E, F, and G are presented to you, you can probably infer that then if that's true, then A, B, C are true too. And then... H-I-J-K, element or P, whatever those elements are, are also true because it's given you enough to infer the rest because we know what it's like to live in the real world. My problem with so much of Star Trek now is that the questions that arise when I watch these episodes literally inhibit my ability to enjoy the show because they're glossing over these things. Look, I didn't, I didn't write a show where immediately... You're going to involve Romulans and their destroyed homeworld. You're going to draw. Uh, you're going to involve some of these Romulans are refugees on one planet, all, 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 but they're also harvesting a Borg cube over here with the artifact. So there's many different questions that I have. There's an entire alphabet's worth of questions to continue my metaphor about the disposition of the Romulan Star Empire based on what they're telling me that interferes in my ability to. Um, like the story, like in this episode of Star Trek, you're well in the whole show of Picard and, and which by the way, they established the destruction of the Romulan homeworld all the way back in 2009. But now they're asking us, they're dealing with the realities of the Romulan civilization as it exists now without answering many questions that viewers would have and say like, but wait a minute, you establish a Romulan colony where everybody seems to be last week pretty okay and 14 years go by and this Romulan colony has descended into basically uh, 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 an old western town during the middle of the Dust Bowl where everybody well why is that 
Why? Has the Romulan Star Empire, are they not taking care of their own people? How much of the Romulan Star Empire exists? How much of it did it exist to begin with? We really never knew. Beyond Romulus and Remus, we would hear about certain planets and things, but they do have an empire, which has been established over the years. So the question remains, if you're going to constantly deal in every episode with the Romulan civilization as it exists post-destruction of Romulus, you got to give us some you've got to give us viewers astute viewers need some kind of 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 give us some background where are we at like there's a romulan reclamation site why are they paying money for that like who or or why are they supporting that who is supporting that is the romulan government itself supporting that and if so where are they are is there is there a romulan senate somewhere where is their starfleet we haven't seen a dideradex battle cruiser or 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 one of those those beautiful starships that were introduced at the end of the neutral zone the last episode of the first season of star trek the next generation so astute star trek viewers look they'll bring back uh itchib ikeb whatever whatever uh, and they'll bring back seven of nine and they'll be like okay so seven of nines in the fenris rangers and she just happens to show up to rescue picard she didn't know who's in that ship she was just rescuing a ship that was under attack by a pirate but but there's all of these questions that have been put out there that that I didn't ask them to overly complicate their situation. And some viewers will be like, what does it matter? What does it matter? And I'm like, well, it matters to me because a lot of what happens in the show doesn't make sense if you have some kind of, of, of political structure happening. Basically, the biggest question is why couldn't Romulans rescue themselves? They had ample opportunity. They knew the star was going to go Nova. Why didn't they relocate the planet? I mean, you look at other shows, like they'll rip off Battlestar Galactica, yet remember when the 12 colonies were destroyed in, in Ron Moore's Galactica, they kept their government together. As a matter of fact, the machinations of that government uh, was fuel, story fuel for a lot of the four seasons of uh, Galactica. You know, what does that all mean? So um, I, it, it bothers me. There's a, sorry, anyway. Um, uh, let's see, where was I? Uh, oh yes. So, so the Richard, that's, that's what I was, uh, Richard, not the Richard, but Richard, that's why I was, that's why I'm nitpicking because there's a lot of, and then they keep adding things. Then you bring back, back Bruce Maddox's character. Then you talk about synths. There's all of these things that they've just brought up. And when, when you're, when you're talking about synthetic life forms you have an entire rich history of Star Trek going all the way back to what are little girls made of in the first season and the androids from iMud. And then you have Dr. Sung's creations. You've got synthetic life forms or mechanical life forms, whether it's the exocomps or the nanites from the episode Home Soil that call human beings mostly bags of, of uh, ugly bags of mostly water. There's so much stuff that they're touching upon that the Star Trek universe has already touched upon and they've got a very slipshod way of dealing with the Star Trek universe, which is, is galling and it's annoying. Um, so yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, Jeffrey Mao says Bob Barker would not approve of Elizabeth's plan for Tallulah. Believe me, I don't approve for them. <laughs> Uh, Timbula the Spider Monkey says, I also love the art of Atari book. I picked it up myself a week or so ago. Oh, yeah. Uh, as many of you, I guess, can see, uh, I do have, let's say, I guess if I put it back over here, um, you can see that right there is the art of Atari book. I'm just moving around stuff on my bookshelves. Uh, actually, John Schnepp gave me that book for my birthday one year. Uh, so uh, it's a very, very cool book. Um, Star Wars Rocks asks, hi, Rob, what did you think of the Clone Wars, uh, season seven, episode one? You know what? I was going to watch it, but I got so sucked into the Brian Green, Joe Rogan podcast that I did not watch it yet. So I'm going to watch that over the weekend. I can't wait. I hope it's good. What did you think? Uh, double crit sent in a super chat and says, hi, Rob, would you recommend Star Trek discovery season two for someone who thought season one was okay? As in six out of 10 enjoyed the discussions here and on the other show. I can't recommend Star Trek Discovery in, in any way, shape, or form. I really can't. Um, I think it's a, 
I think season two actually was was um, in some ways. Look, everyone likes Captain Pike. I hated the portrayal of Spock. I hated the portrayal of of I guess I, again Burnham and being the most important person in the universe and all that. I hated. I especially hated the portrayal of their big bad. Again, Akiva Goldsman, the most cursory understanding of AI. There was nothing. It, it was not up to Star Trek sand standards, and so I can't. But that doesn't mean, look, I don't, I can't recommend it. That doesn't mean I don't want to tell people not to watch it. Hey, if for no other reason, watch it and come back at me and tell me I'm an idiot. <laughs> tell me I'm wrong. Or better yet, come back and tell me what was I missing from the show? What did you like about it? What is it that you liked? And, and, and I'd like to have more of more than just that. I'd love to hear an analysis from anybody. I look when people like things. I want to know. I genuinely want to know. But I don't like when people go. I liked it. Well, why? What is it that worked for you? Why did? And that's the that's the thing. I'm I'm curious as to um, storytelling itself. What is it about stories that work for you, as opposed to stories that don't work for you? Now, what what's always interesting to me is like I, by my own by my own. Um, uh, I guess my own judgment. I know that there are certain stories. I might even not, not love these stories, but I know that certain stories are great stories. They're great stories. And, you know, it wasn't until like, I could even understand when I started reading Shakespeare, when you started reading it in elementary school, like Romeo and Juliet, it was very difficult for me to get past the actual language itself. So it would interfere in my understanding of the stories. But as I got older, it was apparent to me, and as I became more tolerant of Shakespeare, and I was actually, so many so many things would reference Hamlet. You know, you have to go in, in and start reading those stories. But as I got older, it was very apparent to me that the stories of William Shakespeare have endured for a reason. They're, they're masterful stories. They touch on so many different human truths. So um, you can not like Shakespeare as I didn't for the longest time, but I was wrong as a fan of storytelling to not like Shakespeare. Uh, I think anybody that has any, any cursory interest of great stories, I feel the same way, by the way, that's why I feel the same way about the Bible. Whether you are a believer or not, you can understand when you approach the Bible that, okay, this has been one of the most, you can't really understand the great canonical works of western literature or whether it's indeed much of western art whether it's literature whether it's painting whether it's music so much of western art has been uh, inspired by scripture that i think it's important for anybody who's a fan who's an imagination connoisseur all of you imagination connoisseurs you out there members of this the post geek singularity to have a real understanding of where we came from it's important to know your bible you know, one of my favorite stories, and I never tire of variations on this theme, is the story of Job and and the travails that Job went through. Sometimes uh, I've called Elizabeth Job with her teenage daughters, <laughs> and certainly my career in the entertainment industry could be sort of, <laughs> sort of, <laughs> you could say it parallels the story of Job. <laughs> Maybe, uh, you know, it's funny, I was having a converse, that conversation I was having today, I was thinking, huh. But anyway, uh, the the story of Job is something that's always been near and dear to my heart. And I think, you know, again, it's important to know these things. It's important to have a working knowledge of things before you can really get in there. And that's that's one of the frustrating things about Star Trek. I don't like the fact that I keep asking myself these questions about characters. And, like, I, I, I'm not convinced. I, I mean, what's really interesting, you know, it's apparent to me why they they when they made star trek picard it's like oh okay we'll go and and we'll look at an episode like data's day because those are the two episodes you've got measure of a man you have data's day and those are two big bruce maddox episodes even though maddox doesn't appear in data's day but so many so much of the iconography like that you can see where they've gone and they've they've picked things out the new writing staff but they didn't sit down and watch all of the episodes of star trek voyager star trek deep space nine and star trek the next generation they didn't because nobody has that kind of time but really they should have so it's frustrating to watch a show and be like but, but wait a minute what about the you can't yeah so double crit i can't i can't recommend star trek discovery to you but that doesn't mean you shouldn't watch it 
because what do you think? The important thing is, what do you think of Star Trek Discovery? Sean uh, Pullen sent in a super chat and said, if you had a chance to sit down with your old acquaintance, Stuart, what would you say to him about the show? Well, first of all, uh, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily, I don't blow smoke up in, uh, up anyone's ass. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty honest, but it's the way you say things. It's the way you couch things. And I, I would probably sit down with, I mean, I sat down with them for hours uh, for Next Generation. I had really great, you can see it, if, I mean, if you watch the documentaries that we did. And that was me talking to him. That was me interviewing him the whole time. And then, of course, we have the, I, I host the roundtable with the entire Next Generation cast on the Season 2 Blu-ray. So I spent a long time with all the actors. And I, I could be, I could be, um... look, you have to understand, when people make things, especially in motion pictures, everybody thinks what they're making is great. There, there, nobody, I mean, maybe there are certain times when you work on certain movies, low, but people know what they're working on. People are very aware. But when you're working on a show like Picard, it's a prestige show. And Patrick Stewart's a prestige actor. And I think everybody who is putting their heart and soul into the show believes with all of their heart they've made an outstanding television show. And I'm sure a lot of them don't understand why Star Trek fans reject it, because I'll tell you why. Do you know why they don't understand? Because they don't watch the shows. They don't watch the shows. They don't sit down. Do you think Patrick Stewart watches episodes of Picard? You know, Brent Spiner told me that, uh, in all honesty, and I believe him, he goes, I don't watch Star Trek The Next Generation. I've never seen an episode. He's gone to the movies because he has to contractually. He's obligated to go to the, the, the premieres. But he doesn't watch Next Generation. He's like, why would I? Why would I do that? I I acted in the episode, and he's right. I mean, while I've gone back and watched my own work occasionally, I don't sit and watch my own movies, Free Enterprise. I haven't watched my own, I haven't watched that movie in years. You know, I really haven't. I don't. And people that work in the the entertainment business, they they make things and they hope people like them. And when you're working on them and you're busting your ass, there's you don't think that what you're making isn't going to be great. Because you're trying to make the greatest. Tallulah. No. You're trying to make the greatest thing in the world. You know, these these dogs. This is why I can't let them in here. Because when I'm not paying attention to them, they just want to come in and eat cookies. But um, people wanted to see him. So, hey, they have. Um, but but I, y they don't know it's not good. And, and, and so I would be very tactful when I sit down with him and... And and um, and ask um, anonymous. Hey, I know you're so pretty. You're so pretty. But you, yeah, I know. Go out and play. Go go go. Um, anonymous sent in a tip and said, "Why is Seven of Nine walking around like she's Sarah f f fucking O'Connor? Star Trek is trying so hard not to be Star Trek, and it sucks. Give me the Kazinti. Give me Atholian." Absolutely, you can't. You must stop. You must stop. Let's see if I stop talking, they won't bark. Uh, well, first of all, you can't use the Kazinti because those belong to Larry Niven. You'd have to license the Kazinti. But you know what? I would love to see the Kazinti. The Kazinti are a cat-like race, not like the Cations that Lieutenant Mares is from. Um, the Cation, that's, that's an animated series reference. And the Kazinti appear in the animated episode Slaver Weapon. But they are from, I think it's Larry Niven's Known Space series is where they're from. Which is kind of cool that Larry Niven was allowed to cross over the Kazinti with Star Trek. But yeah, I don't understand. I mean, Seven of Nine is a badass. She's supposed to be, again, the fact that you can say that Seven of Nine is like Sarah fucking O'Connor is the problem with the show. Because... Everybody is, is is somebody else transposed from another franchise into Star Trek. And that's the thing that really, I think that's the thing that really bothers me, is, is here's a really interesting character. I mean, I loved Seven of Nine. I loved Jerry Ryan's portrayal of Seven of Nine. By the way, how great does she look? You know, another conversation I was having today is, I mean, Jerry Ryan's 52 years old. She looks amazing. She looks amazing. Who Who doesn't? You know, I mean, this idea that people don't look good in their 50s is silly. Um, but she looks amazing. But yeah, she's not acting like the character. She's not, she was not acting like a character in Star Trek. 
Like, what would happen once a, a Borg, an assimilated Borg, gets back to Earth after where she's at? She's now a ranger. Why is she a ranger? Why isn't she working, helping former Bo Borg drones be be uh, make it back into real life? I mean, none of that makes sense. They've just decided, ooh, let's bring Seven of Nine back and put her in a situation that is not analogous to Star Trek in any way, shape, or form. You know, there was that pilot for the Babylon 5 show, Rangers, the Rangers. Somebody brought that up to me. I mean, you know. Um, Word Balloon, John Suntress is here. Word Balloon sent in uh, from the Word Balloon podcast. Everyone knows I, I love the Word Balloon podcast. He says, uh, he sends in, th thanks for that super chat, buddy. Uh, comic Book News Bulletin. And uh, Dio is out as DC publisher. Next week, Chicago Comic Con should be interesting news wise. I like Dan, but didn't agree with his 5G plans for the DC heroes replaced with legacy heroes. Yeah, I, look, I, I agree. You know, what, what's really interesting to me about the comic industry, they're constantly trying to reinvent these characters for a new generation. And it was, it was interesting because in my lifetime, I saw it begin with Crisis on Infinite Earths. And after that, in the mid-80s, they rebooted their main characters. And, of course, they had John Byrne come in and write Superman and George Perez come in and do Wonder Woman. And then they had various creators come in and do Batman. You know, you had Frank Miller after The Dark Knight Returns. He goes back and he does Batman Year One. And they've constantly been trying to reinvent their superheroes because they figured, oh, new readers will be crushed under how much continuity there is. And I've just, I've always thought that was so strange because I'm like, okay, I get it. Continuity, the ongoing universe, all that's a lot of fun. But just tell your stories that you want to tell. And yeah, so that that's amazing. I mean, now... Again, like everything else, comic books are a 20th century medium. And while I love comic books, and my this room is filled with them, um, in hardcover form, in individual form, my 75 long boxes of comics that I really want to get rid of. I'm about ready, by the way, to just give them all away. <laughs> I really am. Anybody want any comics? Um, but that's really interesting, that uh, the publisher of... DC is out. It'll be interesting to see what they do. But everybody's trying to, you know, get back to the glory days when Image Comics would sell 3 million copies a month. I just don't know if that's ever going to happen. But it's, you know, I'm sorry to see him go. Uh, Michael Stivik, Stivik sent in a super chat and said, When Berman and Braga created Enterprise, I recall a humility. They wanted to simplify. The new writers think they're so profound but are so transparent. You know, it's true. And I, I one of the things I really am sad about when it comes to Enterprise is they really wanted to spend the first year on Earth. And when we interviewed Brandon and Rick for the um, the uh, documentaries for Enterprise, listening to them talk, they, they evoked they evoked the right stuff a lot. They talked about, and if, if you guys have not seen Philip Kaufman's 1983 three hour and 15 minute movie, The Right Stuff, please allow me to recommend that. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. It is a wildly entertaining, irreverent look at the beginnings of the American space program, the beginnings of the Mercury 7 and the Mercury program that later went on to Gemini or Gemini and Apollo. It is so much fun. But they talked a lot about how they wanted the first season of Enterprise to be like the right stuff. You know, they would. it was going to be all Earthbound, and then the final episode of the season, they would launch the NX-01 into space. And I, I, and they would look at the, the founding, the beginnings, the, the inkling of the Federation. You had the Vulcans, and they talked about these things. I'm like, what a great idea for a show. And, of course, they had to deal with the network more so than they had ever had to deal with a network, network before with notes and things, and they didn't want them to do that. And it was really sad because... Enterprise, I think, is a very, they again, it turned into basically a copy of a copy of a copy. And when you go and see when, and they also would joke that, well, everything they did on Enterprise, they were just setting up the show for Manny Cotto to come in and take over for season four. But, um, you know, I think it was a compromise show on many levels. But I do, I do, um, I, 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 I like, Enterprise gets, I think, a bad rap. And, and a lot of it is just, more warmed over stuff, but there's a lot of good things in Enterprise. Um, so anyway, uh, that English gent sent in a super chat. By the way, I'm going to read a letter, I believe, from that English gent. I keep I keep forgetting to read his letter. Um, it was funny because he was calling me Richard in the letter, but that's okay. I, 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 haven't, I haven't forgotten that English gent. 
Um, that English gent says, the greatest tool a storyteller has at their disposal is a great question left unanswered. It'll drive people crazy, but their curiosity will make sure it stays in their minds forever. That is eternal. Yes, but if that's all you do is pile up unanswered questions after unanswered questions, it becomes annoying. Uh, and every episode of Star Trek Picard has given me more and more questions. And it, I, it bothers me. Timbula the Spider Monkey tips sends in a tip and says... Also, also, just to prove I'm not all doom and gloom, how good is it to have Clone Wars back, even if it is only for one season? I'll have to watch it again, but I thought it was a good start. Good to get some more stories of the clones themselves. Listen, I really liked Clone Wars a lot. I was happy to get that sixth season, and I'm really looking forward to the seventh season. I think the Clone Wars was peak Star Wars. I really, I really liked it a lot. I thought it was great. Uh, Joseph sent in a tip and said, Rob, I love you to no end, but if you hate Discovery and Picard so much, why torture yourself and watch it? Just don't watch it and ease the pain. Also, to everyone who says this isn't their Trek, needs to stop living in the past. This is modern Trek. Well, it is. Joseph, you're, a lot of people ask me that, and you're right. But to me, I see Star Trek as it's a continuum in my life. The same way that certain people don't like it when a Republican president comes to power and have to deal with eight years of that person's policies. Um, hopefully only four years of that person's policies. Uh, I feel that way about modern Star Trek. I think that we're living through a time... Uh, the one thing that I find really interesting about Star Trek, from and, and as somebody who is a student of the media and who watches Hollywood trends and who is very interested in the entertainment industry as a whole, I think Star Trek represents a problem. It's a problem for some and not so much for others. But this idea that it's become, okay, because money is, has be, it, it's so expensive to make shows right now that Hollywood needs to mitigate their risk. Star Trek is not the only franchise that is being resurrected. I mean, it was gone, it laid fallow for, well, on television at least, since 2005, they made these movies that don't let anyone tell you that the J.J. Abrams movies were that successful based on their cost, uh, to what they made. They were not that successful and, and Beyond was not successful at all. But it's interesting to watch Star Trek because they're trying to reinvent. The thinking is let's... I think it's such weird thinking because executives are just saying, oh, what can we resurrect and throw at the wall? And they think name recognition only will allow something to catch on with the public without understanding what it is about that property that was good in the first place. And, you know... What, what, Lost in Space, to me, has run two seasons on Netflix. I thought the second season, the first half I thought really loved a lot. The second half I thought was a little half-baked. But why that show works so well is they've really leaned into the family aspects of it. Whether you love Lost in Space, just like it, or maybe you don't like it at all because Parker Posey, who I usually love, has become so annoying. Um, I like the show, and it works because I think the family dynamic is genuine. I like the mother, I like the father, I like the kids, I like the characters. And first and foremost, they you know that those characters love one another. And what's so great is, I love how they throw obstacles at them. Just when you think they've pulled their, their, their bacon out of the frying pan, something happens and it gets worse. I love that. I think it's great. And so you get it. But may, bringing back these franchises, for me, I don't have an option. I literally sometimes wish I could walk away from Star Trek, but also if just because I've been watching Star Trek my whole life, it's fascinating to me to see where they're taking it, where it goes. I just wish that you had a group of people that really, that the, the, there was a core team that, look, everybody says they love Star Trek. I can tell within two seconds whether somebody says they love Star Trek, if they really love Star Trek, because who's going to say they don't? You know, everybody's going to say, oh, I love Star Trek. At least J.J. Abrams was straight up honest and said, I never liked Star Trek. I always liked Star Wars better. I don't know why they would hire that guy to make Star Trek movies, but okay. At least he was honest about it. But I, I, um, I, I just, who doesn't love Star Trek? Everybody wants a job. But you'd think if they got a core team of people together that really loved Star Trek. And the funny thing is, I could go, if you asked me, if you said right now, if you said right now, Rob, you have 60 minutes to put together your writing staff for Star Trek, and we have to approve them, I would, I could do it. There, there are people, I'd call up 10 people I know or send them emails or texts right now who are all 
heavy hitter TV writers with deep, deep credits. I would put together that core team and we'd make a Star Wars or a Star Trek series that would blow you away. But none of those people are working on Star Trek. But, you know, I would, I would do that. Um, so I, I, I can't... It, and the thing is, to me, I don't think it is modern Trek. I think it's a show that is using the Star Trek brand name to try and be Star Trek, but it's not. And the funny thing is... If it was better, it would be a water cooler show. Star Trek was a water cooler show. The next generation certainly was. You know, best of both worlds. That was a fucking water cooler cliffhanger, man. Star Trek should be that way now. It should be that way now. People should talk about Star Trek the way, and everybody said, well, you know, Star Trek has always been sort of niche. Yeah, but it should be really great. They've got the money. They don't have the storytellers. So... Dancing Dog 60 sent in a tip and said, Hello, Rob. I once met Charles Band at his traveling horror road show about a decade ago. He spoke about how it's impossible for low budget genre films to play in theaters these days. He said it's due to the demise of grind houses and drive ins. So sad. Well, he's right. Now, for those of you who don't know who Charles Band is, well, he used to be a boss of mine, but he's also been making movies since. Boy, the 70s, and he's had various incarnations, various companies. Empire Pictures was his. He produced Reanimator and From Beyond and Dolls and Trancers. And even before that, he was he was a, a empresario of low budget features. He started Media later Media Home Entertainment and Wizard Video. And he acquired movies like I Spit on Your Grave and put them out on video. And in the 90s, he or in the late 80s, he created Full Moon Entertainment, made the subspecies movies, and continued the Trancers movies. I worked for him when I worked on Arcade. I worked with Dan Schweiger and later my buddy Dave Parker, who directed The Hills Run Red. Um, yeah, so uh, he's great. But yeah, I mean, he made his money. I mean, Laser Blast, another movie of his, or The Day Time Ended. These were early efforts by him. These played in movie theaters. And what's interesting now is is movie theaters, there's no B-movies playing in movie theaters. B-movies all went to TV or the Sci-Fi Channel, and it's really too bad. And, and even the horror we get is the horror in theaters with all the ghosts and things. It's, it's highbrow, even, even paranormal activity. We don't have any sleazy grind. You're not going to see Abel Ferrara's Driller Killer or the likes of that in theaters anytime soon. Who's going to go see those things? But yeah, we don't have any soda stick grindhouses anymore, drive-ins. It's too bad. I mean, you know, where did teenagers go to make out? Do they even make out anymore? Or do they just watch Pornhub and RedTube and send each other videos? <laughs> do they actually meet? Uh, it's too bad. I miss the days of that. But he's right. He is right. And he was a grindhouse empresario, Charlie Band was. Stubble McShave sends in a tip and says, The role of grown-ups and kids is dependent on the target audience of a show. If the target group are young people, the grown-ups are stupider villains. Stories for adults are more well-rounded. Older shows were aimed at an older audience. Different demographics. Well, they are now, but they didn't used to be. Like, you know, when I was a kid, there were two primetime cartoons. Or animated shows, I guess. Well, there's probably more, but I remember two. There's the Flintstones and there's Johnny Quest. I loved Johnny Quest. I loved Johnny Quest and his buddy Haji and their dog Bandit. But you still had Dr. Benton Quest and you had Race Bannon. You know, they were this show is, and again, people would tell you that Johnny Quest was developed or, or directed. It was, it was developed and directed and to be seen by the whole family. And indeed it was. But... It still was, the kid was the protagonist. I mean, it was called Johnny Quest. And I love that show. I still love that show. Um, getting It's out on Blu-ray. Has it come out or is it coming out? Um, it's amazing. And I think what, what was interesting, even shows that were certainly Leave it to Beaver was directed to kids and family members, but it is, it is different demographic, demographics, but something has changed. You know, parents have put their children like in front of them, they're like, oh, I can't let anything else happen to my kids or whatever. But in letting kids run the show, I don't necessarily, or making TV shows where the kids are the smartest people in the room, I don't think that did anyone any favors. Um, Anthony sends in a tip and says, who is a better character, Ensign Rowe or Bellana Torres? Well, I mean, Ensign Rowe is only in nine episodes of Next Gen. 
So, Belana Torres had a whole series to herself. I think, look, I thought Ensign Rowe was an incredible addition to the Star Trek family. I love Michelle Forbes as Ensign Rowe. I thought she was uh, could do no wrong, and they really did a good job developing her character. I think Belana Torres, though, I liked her as well. You know, uh, and Roxanne Dawson has gone on to become a great television director in her own right. So I'm a huge fan of of both characters. Uh, I don't know who was better, but I think that Ensign Rowe for the nine episodes we saw her in was great, but I also think Belana Torres was great too. Thomas Ruffley sent in a chat and says, I'm not sure what to think about Picard. I feel we are in an alternative universe that slipped out of what incredible stories could reflect today. Um, you're probably not wrong about that. Speaking of that, you know what? I'm going to jump in and read a letter, because why not? Uh, this letter comes from Dean Mikitich, our friend Dean in the UK. Hi, Rob and the PGS. Living in the UK, we don't really have the big comic book stores like you find in every town in the US. Well, not so much anymore, but you will not find them in medium to small towns in this country. They all seem to be in the cities. Because of this, I was it was not until my it was in my mid teens when I first picked up a proper copy of a Marvel or DC comic. Now that is not to say comics were not available in the UK; they are, but it was more Danny Bino in 2000 AD, which you could pick up from any newsstand. We did for a time in the 80s have Marvel UK, but I was living overseas, so never saw them. In the early 90s, Titan Publishing started to do reprints of Spider-Man and the X-Men, along with a few others. However, they would have more than one story going in these pages, and it was never in order. It was not until I moved to London when I first went to a proper comic book store. This was Calamity Comics in Harrow on the Hill. Each weekend, my friends and I would travel from Uxbridge up to the comic book store and buy the latest issues. However, buying comics was not cheap. While the exchange rate was good at the time, a $2 comic should have cost around one pound. We also have to pay the import costs, which stuck another $1.50 or, or one pound 50, uh, one pound 50 quid or 150 quid <laughs> onto the price. So picking up a couple of comics was not too bad, but picking them up five to 10 and it started to get expensive for a snot nosed teen without a large income. In my early 20s, I moved from away from London to Gatwick, and traveling into London each weekend to pick up new comics was not something I could do on a regular basis, as I now had commitments that stopped me from doing the trip. So, I stopped collecting. When I moved back to London, I was living in southeast London, and the nearest comic book stores were all in central London. This was not a major issue, as I was also working there as well. With one of your favorite comic book stores around the corner from where I work, Orbital Comics, I never really got back into collecting again. Today, I don't find stories in Marvel and DC as enjoyable as I once did. That is not to say I have given up on collecting. I'm now into collecting books that are not your superhero type. A few years ago, I came across St uh, Stepan Sajak. I, Saj I can't even pronounce that. Vesna, how do you pronounce that? Is that, is that, uh, that Serbo-Croatian? How, how do you pronounce that? He is a well-known artist for DC and Image Comics. The picture I had come across was of Harley Quinn straddling the Arkham Knight and the dogs. There's dogs outside barking at Tallulah. I'm sorry. And, and, and Gilbert. The picture I had come across was of Harley Quinn straddling the Arkham Knight and drawing lips on his mask with lipstick held between her teeth. I remember that. While looking at his page and soaking up the art, I saw he has a sub-account going by the name uh, Chinez. So I headed over to look at the art there. It's here I learned he was creating his own webcomic and publishing it on the site. This is not your typical superhero comic, but a love story between two women who are into BDSM. <laughs> you know, you know that Vess is like, what? Where is this? The story is <laughs> the story is heartfelt, funny, and has lots of pop culture references in it. And you know that Willow too. You might as well just send him the link. It goes by the name Sunstone. Given how you like the rocking horse, the rocking horse, you mean the Herman McKink's rocking machine? I think this will be right up your alley, and I'm sure that if Willow or Vesna read it, they will be giggling like a couple of schoolgirls. Paula, too, I'm sure. Some of, of the imagines are of a mature type, but done tastefully, so you'll need to be a member of the site in order to see them. Here's a link to his gallery, and the story there is on the left-hand side. Um, you know what? I'll put a link right now. I'm going to put it in the... Uh, Look at that. <laughs> Here, here's the link. Here's This is for Vesna, Paula, and uh, Willow. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> uh, 
Um, uh, Rob, what non-superhero comics would you recommend? Regards, Dean M. Well, if you like that, Alan Moore did a comic called Lost Girls about people like Wendy from Peter Pan. And uh, if you like that kind of stuff, I would highly recommend it. Alan Moore doing um, fairy tale porn, really. But it's actually really good stuff. Of course, one of my very favorite comics of all time is Howard Chaikin's American Flag. Um, Howard Chaikin's American Flag. Which is uh, right here. So, yeah, this actually um, is one of my, let's see, is, this is one of my favorite comics of all time. And basically it deals with the future America and uh, the artwork. I mean, I love, if you can see it, I love Chaikin's art. I love his panel designs. I love Ken Brusnak's lettering. Um, I mean, this stuff is just... This comic is great. In town to do some business. Look at that. So yes, I um, that's one of my highly recommended comics. I also like uh, Frank Miller's things like Give Me Liberty and, and Ronin. Um, there's a comic that I cannot recommend highly enough. Daniel Close, Patience, which you have to read. It's a time travel comic. And you know, there, there are comics like... Um, um, uh, you know, I like Mr. X, Dean Motter's Mr. X. Uh, Howard Chaikin also wrote an interesting series. It's not about superheroes, but it's in the DC Universe called Twilight. Um, and of course, I guess it is superheroes, but uh, Grendel. More, I love Matt Wagner's Grendel and Mage and all that kind of stuff. But there's a lot of, I mean, I look around and there's a lot of, of non... There's a comic I like called Local. Uh, if you look into that, it's pretty interesting. So, but Dean, thank you for writing in. Uh, let's see what else I got here. What other letters? I don't know what that English gent uh, is, but um, I'm looking for, for that. Mm, I don't know what, I, I don't know what that English gent's name is. So anyway, well, this one's, I like this. This is a good letter. I like this letter. Uh, this letter comes from our man, Stephen Goggin. Uh, Dear Robin listeners, one of my other favorite genres of film is westerns, and I'm also a big fan of country music. I was recently watching two westerns that are well below the radar, and I thought I might give them a mention. The first is McKenna's Gold. I love McKenna's Gold. Starring Gregory Peck, Omar Sharif, and Telly Savalas. The film is a treasure hunt film, a MacGuffin chase, but a MacGuffin chase that is done well. The film felt very much like an Indiana Jones film, and the way they shot the desert scenes was very much like the Dawn of Man sequence in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Yet this film was made before that classic, and long before Raiders of the Lost Ark. I also like the Quincy Jones soundtrack to this film and the earworm of a title song, Old Turkey Buzzard. It is one of my favorite westerns, and I got it on Blu-ray, as I cannot find it on any of the streaming services. The next western I give mention to is The Ballad of Cable Hogue, starring Jason Robards, Once Upon a Time in the West, and Stella Stevens. I love this rather quirky western romantic comedy. I actually enjoyed the romance between Stella Stevens and Jason Robards in the movie. What surprised me about this film was who did the soundtrack, and it is Jerry Goldsmith. And I love the song in the fl film Butterfly Morning, sung by what I call a non-singing non singers, Jason Robards and Stella Stevens. One thing I like about old westerns is the opening theme song in a movie. Then sometimes you have a narrator setting you up for the story of the film. I miss some of this in modern filmmaking. Thank you for all that you do and live long and prosper. Yours truly, Stephen G., the Irishman in Somerset. Well, I always love hearing about what people like in terms of things that they uh, that they enjoy. If it, it, It's great to hear from you guys, so tell me what you like. Um, Joe Folly writes in, Hello, Robert, and my friends in the Post Geek Singularity. I hope all of you are doing the one thing a day to move you closer to your goals and dreams. Last night, I had a fun time attending a double feature, and I have a lot to say about both movies. Uh, first up for discussion is Birds of Prey, featuring Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. I enjoy it, but I think it may be my least favorite DCEU movie to date. For me personally, it felt like a standard MCU outing, extremely average and forgettable. A somewhat heavy-handed and quirky experience at the theaters. Would I want to see it again? 
Probably not anytime soon. Would I be down for a sequel? Sure. I'm not going to pretend I know much about Harley Quinn as a solo character, and I know even less about the Birds of Prey. That being said, I enjoyed the characterizations of Huntress and Black Canary quite a bit. Huntress's awkwardness made her cute, yet still being a badass that I wouldn't want to cross. Seeing Black Canary in action was awesome, even though I was a little disappointed by the overall action sequences of the film. They weren't bad by any means, but to me they were lackluster. Going into a cartoony R-rated action flick, I was hoping for more over-the-top creativity in these fights. It doesn't help that I knew that the John Wick directors help with these sequences. Give me a gun that shoots out a boxing glove. Give me an example as to why these ladies are badasses. There was never a point I felt Huntress had a chance to display her crossbow skills in a satisfying way. I also love Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. Just like in Suicide Squad, I think she nails the character. She's really fun to watch, really funny, and works well on her own without Mr. J. She's weird, zany, and over the top, but never in the movie did I feel she was a psychopath. When I think of Harley Quinn and the Joker, I think full-blown insanity, unpredictable wild cards, not knowing their next move. Maybe craziness is more Joker's thing, but that is literally my only nitpick about the character. I think anyone trying to take on the role of Harley after Margot Robbie is going to be have a tough time. As I stated in a previous letter, the aspect I was looking most forward to is Ewan McGregor's Black Mask. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little disappointed with what we got. I liked him as a character. I thought it was weird that they made him a sexist, but whatever. It felt like we were watching a glimpse into Black Mask's origin, but that really wasn't the case at all. You're telling me that you're going to introduce Black Mask into your universe as this film's main villain and he's only going to don the mask for 15 seconds? No. Just no. We'll never see Black Mask square off against Batman? I'm not sure if wasted potential is strong enough for a word for how I feel. And now for the biggest sin of this movie, Cassandra Kane. I have no clue what they were thinking with this character. I feel the same way as I did about Luke in Star Wars Episode Eight: The Last Jedi. She in no way, shape, or form embodies the character of Cassandra Kane. The resemblance is by name only. The best way I can justify the decision is maybe she stole that name. Since she's portrayed as a professional thief and pickpocket, she needed to steal an identity and maybe steal the real Cassandra Kane. And maybe since the real Cassandra Kane cannot talk yet, she got away with it. Although she was arrested and briefly put through the police system, so my theory might be bunk right out of the gate. I know this letter sounds like I hated the movie, but I didn't. I'm just puzzled at a number of decisions made. This movie may be objectively better and more coherent than Suicide Squad, but I enjoyed it less. I think DC is taking a smart approach with villain-focused films, because now when they square off with their hero counterparts, it will feel much more special. This particular outing felt like I was watching a two-hour first act that left me without a satisfying catharsis and hoping for more next time. I'm still on board for a sequel and hoping Harley Quinn makes an appearance in James Gunn's Suicide Squad as well. I'd only recommend Birds of Prey if you're already a fan of the DCEU or if you are craving a night out at the theater. Thank you for reading my letter. Up next on my double feature review is my take on Sonic the Hedgehog, which I already read. Until then, this is your biking friend signing off from Chicago, Joe Fowley. P.S. Now I want an egg sandwich. <laughs> well, thanks for writing in. I liked that. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Thomas roughly already said, I'm not sure what to think about Picard. I feel we're in an alternate universe that slipped out of what incredible stories could reflect today. I do too. Like uh, the funny thing about what I what I feel about Star Trek Picard that I think is sort of strange is that by putting all of this gobbledygook from other franchises, we're talking about synths, we're talking about 7 of 9 being a Fenris Ranger and organ trafficking and and all this stuff. I feel all of that is it's all very contemporary. And, and where is the interesting science fiction hook that we haven't seen before that somehow ties into where Picard is going? I, I guess, I guess it, it's interesting. We, didn't, we don't really know much about Picard. Like, I would like to have seen more of his life. Like, spend, spend... It was interesting. They had a really interesting hook. So he's reflecting back on this terrible disaster and what it meant to him. But, you know, it would have been interesting to see him go on a speaking lecture, like maybe at a book signing and seeing where he was at, like give him, show us more of, of, of where Picard is. Uh, it was like maybe traveling around the cosmos and, and give him, give him like, I just, I, I guess I don't know. I don't know what he, what he wants. 
I don't know what he really, other than I need to go on a mission for my sins. They gave me one, but, but it's, it's like, we don't, we, we don't know what he wants or what he's doing or why it's, I don't know. There could have been incredible stories that are being told, but we're not. We're getting stories that were from a bunch of other different places thrown together in a blender. And I, it bothers me. Dancing Dog sent in a tip and said, Also, I would love to see Robert Heinlein's Starship Troopers accurately done on film. Your thoughts? Well, you know, they did. When they made those DTV sequel, sequels, they got a little better. But yeah, I mean, st- uh, look, I love Paul Verhoeven's Starship Troopers. I know it's not the book. I know there's no power suits. I, I know. I've heard everybody say that. I get it. I read Starship Troopers, and I think you're right. They could probably go and really adapt Starship Troopers and make it more like the book, but I don't think that means that the Starship Troopers that we got was necessarily bad, because I really, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Um, Clinging Mars sent in a super chat and says, Maddox recasting is awful. He acts and looks nothing like him. I, I agree. I, You know, Brian Brophy has such a unique face, too. And I loved his voice. And I, I think by give, giving us a Maddox that was all scruffy bearded, I think they probably did that so we didn't know about, you know, we couldn't tell who he was. But, I mean, Brian Brophy, the actor who played Maddox, is the head of the theater arts division here at Caltech. And and here, like, literally down the street. I live down the street from Caltech. I mean, I could have walked down there and said, brah, I mean, how many days did they shoot with him? Why not? How cool would that have been? I mean, I can understand why I could, each of, whatever. <laughs> uh, why do I not know how to pronounce his name today? Uh, why they didn't get Manu to come back. I understand that. I, I uh, that, yes. But why not recast Maddox? He was, I mean, why recast him? Brian Brophy is such an interesting actor. Um, I, I, I agree with you, Clinging Mars. 100%. Uh, Hapkido Locke tipped and says, Rob, do such young writers exist in Hollywood? Star Trek was set in a flourishing literary sci-fi milieu, but Harry Seldon's are hard to come by. Ooh, nice reference. And while my son might be able to quote lines from Hamlet, he's really only quoting Conscience of the King. Well, remember, I mean, Ron Moore was a young man when he started writing, and he was a fan of Star Trek. I mean, you got to start somewhere. I think there are great young writers out there. Uh, I do. I think you just have to find them. But your point is certainly well taken. Um, I like that. And Harry Seldon, man, let's hope that Foundation series is good, right? Harry Seldon is another one of my one of my literary sci-fi heroes, the creator of Psycho History. Um, yeah, for the people, that's a Isaac Asimov. If you haven't read the, the original Foundation trilogy, what are you waiting for? Go read it. Why don't they rip that off? Maybe they will for Star Trek Discovery. Maybe they have. Um, but you're right, that's funny. <laughs> He's only really quoting the conscience of the king. Well, hey man, you know, uh, Star Trek is how I, that's, conscience of the king is where, where I lear- learned what that was. You know, I didn't understand conscience of the king. I didn't understand Hamlet, Hamlet, Lenore Caridian. You know, I didn't get all that. I learned it from Star Trek. Uh, Jedi and friend to Alita sent in a tip. As a huge Trek fan, I've been disgusted with the murders too. Dodge was advertised to be a main character in the trailers, and then she is brutally murdered halfway through the first episode. I thought, this isn't Trek, and it disgusted me. I mean, think about how many people we've seen graphically murdered on this show. I mean, come on, man. Uh, can kids watch that? I agree. Episode 5 was the last straw. I mean, I'm still going to watch it, but man... You know, and, and Michael Chabon coming out with that lame excuse, well, you know, the people had to deal with censorship. No, it's not because they had to deal with censorship. They were more, you know, it wasn't so much censorship on the original Star Trek. It was that, look, people, creators of the day knew you weren't going to swear. You weren't going to show uh, long sex scenes. You could barely show. There's one scene where Kirk's sitting on the edge of a bed pulling his boots on in wink of an eye. And I get that. Or they threw him a few curves in bread and circuses. Understand. I mean... But come on, they knew their limitations. I don't think they would have shown graphic violence if they could have in the first place. Why would you do that? Um, Stubble McShave also says, uh, When the Star Wars EU became legends, I gave away a lot of my EU books to a friend because I was excited about the new stories. Now I've bought the EU books again and I'm going through them. They're so much better and now they're my headcanon for all the post-Jedi Star Wars. Well, I think that's the real problem. 
you know, with I, I think the 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 sequel trilogy, the real problem with the sequel trilogy, and I blame I blame J.J. Abrams, is that he didn't go look. He didn't know. As much as he's a Star Wars fan, he wasn't reading the EU books, but he should have. Or people at his very, very well uh, uh, paid people at Bad Robot, he should have got a bunch of... I would have hired five people to do nothing but read those books. There's already readers reading books and, and writing coverage at the studios anyway. I'm sure he's got a reading department. Just hire them to read all the Star Wars EU books. That would have been my first stop. But I know. Uh, Jedi and friend to Alita says, I've tried to give Picard the benefit of the doubt and be as lenient as possible, judging it, hoping that his show could get more people into Trek. After each of, I can't defend Picard. The scene where, the scene where Rafi and her son, with Rafi and her son was sad too. Picard's not enjoyable. Well, you know what? I mean, what, here's, here's, if I may, um, and I like what Dave Cullen said. By the way, shout out to Dave Cullen. Uh, I like Dave Collins' channel a lot, and he, he gave me a nice shout-out on, on his channel today, so I appreciate that, Dave. But Dave really leaned into the, the whole Rafi and her son thing. What the hell, man? Really? A black woman who is also a drug addict and a deadbeat mother. First of all, in a science fiction show that uses the prism of sci-fi action adventure to reflect back on our world, what is the 24th equivalent of of a deadbeat mom i guess just a deadbeat mom who wasn't there i mean and then the 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 son's reaction was also this was 20th century cliche tv it was cliche in the 70s and where why is that in star trek why am i watching this scene you know so raffi went from being a a dedicated starfleet officer to becoming a 20th century deadbeat mom None of it makes sense. I mean, even in, I, I think, didn't I say it yesterday? Even in, I was saying it to Darren, my friend Darren Docterman, who actually worked on Picard. Even in Aliens, when Sigourney Weaver comes back and is revived after 57 years floating around on the Narcissus in the depths of space, she doesn't just, like, sit in a room medicating herself. She goes out and she gets a, a job on the docks using a power loader that, oh, hey, we've never seen a power loader. How cool is that? Future tech that plays oh later into the plot but raffi is just i don't like raffi to me raffi is is a, is a wasted character it's a character you're in the 24th century and you want to move into a trailer in vasquez rocks isn't there something else you could do couldn't you become i don't know a merchant marine you take your entire starfleet why don't you go work for somebody and work help the romulans anyway i just hate the fact that they just made raffi raffi because oh reasons Let's, hey, it's not enough that she was fired from Starfleet and lives in a trailer. Let's make her a drug addict. And oh, hey, let's make her a deadbeat mom whose son doesn't like her. Wow. There is some really creative science fiction writing for you. Gosh. I mean, if I was in the Star Trek Picard writer's room, I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Are you kidding me? No. Even Manifest would never do that. <laughs> Richard sends in, did you ever see Ira's rough draft for DS9 Season 8, Episode 1? One would think Kurtzman and company are just craven cynics, but it's not like the old Star Trek writers would be any different. It's not that they don't want to write... Let me go. Want to write... Uh, want to write, you said, continued. I did see what they were going to do for Season 8. I thought it was actually pretty interesting on that documentary. Anthony Gonzalez sends in a tip and says, Compare Picard writers and storytelling to what we leave behind Season 8 writer's room. These guys a thousand percent understood the characters and the world building and setting. I know. I know. I agree. I love what they did. What you're referring to is the DS9 documentary, What We, Le what we Left Behind, has a sequence where they get the writers together to plot out the first episode, and they talk about what season eight would have been like for Deep Space Nine. It was pretty good. I mean, you know what? I don't understand. I would love to do a Star Trek Deep Space Nine revival. Like, if I could do anything with Star Trek right now, I'd either create something out of whole cloth, but I would love to do a Deep Space Nine series. Why? You've got standing sets. You know, you've got the, the a lot of those actors. I mean, certainly Alexander Sadig has gotten a lot of credits. Nana Visitor is still 
uh, a pistol. I, I'm very sorry. I, I missed. I was asked to go, but I couldn't do it. The episode, the upcoming episode with her for the Inglorious Trexperts podcast. I mean, you can't not watch that documentary and be like, my God, Nana Visitor has certainly aged like fine wine. Put her in charge. <laughs> you know, watch, put her in charge. Yes, put her in charge. Make a new Star Trek show. Make a new Deep Space Nine show. And uh, yeah, why not? And you know what? Make it canonical. You want to have that that amount of time have have transpired. You could still do that. I mean, I think it'd be great. Why not? Um, Timbula the Spider Monkey says, "Have you seen the Gamera complete box set? Arrow are releasing. Well, there goes a bunch of Quatlus. Oh yes, I have. And God love Arrow. Of all, you know what? I honestly think of all of the physical media companies that are working, that are coming out today, that are putting stuff out today. Arrow might be my favorite." Because they really do it upright. Of all, I, I mean, everything they do, their their box sets, uh, their, their choices of, of of releasing things, and I know they've had overlap with Shout and Wellgo and all that, but man, do they do a great job, man! I mean that that West uh, or Water West, I was gonna say West Side Story, that Waterworld box set with the Ulysses cut, my God, God, I love Arrow. Go buy something from Arrow and tell them I sent you. Go tweet them. Tweet them and tell them I sent you because, man, they're good. But, yeah, I'm going to get that Gamera box set. Uh, Thelma ML sent in a super chat and said, The Star Trek Picard has a personality problem. Is it trying to be Game of Thrones, Stargate Universe, Battlestar Galactica, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Blade Runner, Terminator? It's trying to be all those things. I would suspect that we're going to see a lot more Blade Runner soon uh, in the show. Whether it's going to be good, I don't know. Uh, Claude Hibbert sent in a super chat and said, Rob, do not the FNGs, new guys, get you down. I don't let anybody get me down. I Look, my youthful exuberance is going to uh, be retained in my life, and I, I'm uh, excited. I'm, I'm excited. I, uh, uh, I, I, am, I am an eternal optimist uh, because why not? Like, you know what? It's a lifestyle choice. If you want to choose to be Debbie Downer, well, that's okay. Uh, like just because I rail against Star Trek doesn't mean just doesn't mean I mean come on man, as I sit here in my uh, observatory look at and this is just a couple of shelves I got shelves all the way around me, full of great stuff. What's not to love? You know, Star Trek and Star Wars might be letting us down, but hey man, The Expanse season five wrapped, woohoo! No time to die is coming out in a month, a little over a month. I mean, come on, what is not to love? You know, here's, I'll tell you something. So when I was in high school, I think I've told this story before, but when I was in high school, uh, actually I might've been in junior high. Well, when Fast Times at Ridgemont High came out, there, here, here, here is a, here is one of the guiding, and I kid you not, Fast Times at Ridgemont High came out and taught me one of the guiding principles of life. And, and Mike Damone is telling Mark Ratner uh, about dating and, and how you should handle dating. And they're in the mall, Mark Ratner's, you know, works at the movie studio and Stacy Jennifer Jason Lee is working at the pizza parlor but Mark Ratner wants to take Stacy out and Mike Damone the, the 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 coolest guy in school who scalps tickets or whatever even though we find out he's not the coolest guy in school later but he's explaining um how to how to pick up a girl like how to how to get a girl to go out with you and he's explaining the rules of how to be with a girl and basically he says and I totally agree with this he basically says and he he turns to a cardboard cutout of Debbie Harry of Blondie herself Debbie Harry puts her puts his arm around the cardboard cutout and he says listen Mark whenever you go out with a girl it doesn't matter where you are you have to act like that's the place to be and Damone looks at her and he's like Debbie hi isn't this great and I think there's an important lesson there I think you should it is great I mean, look, human history sucked. Most of human history was terrible. It was awful. People died from everything. There was famine and pestilence and war and just awfulness, horrible diseases, syphilis. People had terrible teeth. You couldn't, nobody bathed. I mean, it was horrible. History sucked. It was, it was not good. We live at like the best time. There's all kinds of injustice and horror beyond imagining still happening on the planet to this day. Why are we slaughtering big animals like rhinoceroses and giraffes and 
elephants, I don't know. We should be the custodians of these creatures, not destroying them. Because who knows why they're a part of our biosphere still. We don't understand, but oh, we take it for granted. But anyway, I digress. Point is, life is great. It's a lifestyle choice. There's as, as much as I might want, like Star Trek or Star Wars, that doesn't matter. I still have a three foot resin model of a Star Destroyer I, I want to build. You know, there's still, I've got many Starship models that I haven't even cracked open yet. There's, there's still many things to love about, about Star Trek and Star Wars, and you shouldn't get mad. I mean, you know, I don't let people get me down. Because why? why? There's too much cool shit in the world. The world is full of cool stuff. And uh, not just stuff. I mean, I don't mean from a materialistic standpoint. I mean, one night I can sit there and I can read, you know, I uh, turn on the TV, I watch the Joe Rogan podcast and Brian Greene and his book Until the End of Time. I didn't even know who Brian Greene was. I did not know that he taught it. At um, I didn't know that he was a theoretical physicist, a mathematician, and a string theorist. He's been a professor at Columbia University since 1996 and chairman of the World Science Festival since co-founding it in 2008. I had no idea this dude existed. I certainly didn't go to Columbia. And last night, for two and a half hours, I was riveted by the Joe Rogan podcast. And now, I'm going to get his book. I'm excited to get his book. All because I learned something new and met a, a personality I didn't know. I heard a story I had yet to hear last night, and I wake up I, I was I, with a bounce in my step. I was very excited when I got up this morning because it was there was something new. And you know what? There's something new every day. You don't even have to have any money. You can walk to the library. There's just you're, you should click around YouTube. There's just too much awesome shit in the world, and I understand. I understand. People would say that, well, Rob, you grew up in a Western country. You were adopted by a fine family and you had a good public school education and you were middle class to upper middle class growing up. So you have all kinds of privilege. This is true. So uh, my, even my outlook, my rosy disposition and my outlook on life is as a result of privilege. But you know what? We all, all of us who are born in the 20th or 21st centuries are very privileged because we didn't grow up in any other time of human history because it sucked. It was bad. Uh, and yeah, there were certain good things about it, but for the most part, human history sucked. And I'm glad to be alive here. I'm glad to be alive now. I'm glad to be alive so I can have this forum to talk to you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um. Uh, Clingy Mars sends in a super chat and says, bring back Star Trek open script submissions. Yeah, you know, that's never going to happen. <laughs> no one will ever allow that anymore. It worked for a while, but then it didn't work, unfortunately. I think that would be great if they did. For those of you who don't know, Star Trek used to have an open script submission policy. They had to change it later. But in Next Generation, after the first couple seasons, they let anybody write scripts. And that didn't mean anybody got in. But uh, I even wrote a script and an outline um well i helped a friend of mine we came up with the story together he wrote the script but then i did send an outline in it was god awful it was called lost data um and i wrote it during the second season but i don't think they can now the world has changed a little bit and claude hibbert sent in a super chat and says watu <laughs> the watcher uh your take on star trek is essential constructive and unique well thank you you're not a gatekeeper. You're providing a necessary uh, Q and A. Is that uh, is that a uh, Q and Q A? Do you mean uh, uh, perspective? Um, aspirational Star Trek is better. Well, Claude, thank you for saying so. I think so too. Star Trek Star Trek should be aspirational. Like I was saying yesterday, it should be fun. It should be fun. You know, I don't. It's not fun to start a Star Trek episode and watch an old beloved secondary character get murdered by well, Mercy killed after he gets his eye popped out. I mean, what is that? Um, uh, Clinging Mars also said, Cisco being a good father to Rafi's deadbeat mom. Oh, I know. You know what's really funny? Uh, I mean, I've said this before, but the portrayal of Benjamin Cisco as a single black father with a great relationship with his young son is one of the great things about Deep Space Nine. They don't even mention, yes, Far Beyond the Stars directly addresses racism, but that show... It was one of the greatest examples of how you lead by inclusion without making it a big deal. And Deep Space Nine had that. Uh, it was overflowing with that. And you're absolutely right. But Rafi's a deadbeat mom. Wow, really? You know what? You can't have a, a relationship like Benjamin Sisko? Oh, no. 
Because, boy, you know what? Making her a deadbeat mom, my God. Even my screenwriting teacher in college 30 years ago, if I had written that scene into a script, he would have been like, come on, dude. Really? Uh, I don't allow my writers to write such hackneyed, cliched scenes that have been done better in 100,000 different other mediums or uh, other shows. I mean, give me a break. Um, Jedi and friend to Alita says I skipped his uh, comment about The Expanse. Did I? Well, let me... Oh. Yes, I did. Um, Jedi and friend Ulita says, The Expanse carries the torch of the true Star Trek spirit. Compare how Holden refused to kill the security officer antagonist of season four with the disregard of life in modern Trek. It's night and day. Plus, The Expanse is actually fun and enjoyable. The thing about The Expanse, and Jedi and friend Ulita, I totally agree with you. Um, the thing about The Expanse is that they've got, there's going to be, I think eight have been published, and there's going to be a total of nine, and then there's a book of, of short stories that take place in the same universe. So they have the benefit of the books. And the books are great. And the books get bonkers too. I can't wait to see where it's all going to go. But, um, I mean, I we know where it's going to go, but how they're going to do it on the show, they've done a great job. So they do have the books, which I think is great. But you're right. I love... I, 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 yeah, Picard is not enjoyable. Picard is not enjoyable because I, I feel like I, 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 it should be enjoyable. I mean, it should be... You know, it, you know what? There's a movie, I don't know why, this just popped into my head. And I understand, it, it. it's a movie called Hopscotch with Walter Matthau and Glenda Jackson's in it. And it's a movie about basically an old spy. Walter Matthau plays an old spy. And I don't want to ruin it for you. I'm not going to ruin it for you. But he basically... Mm, he goes on sort of a globe-trotting adventure, and all of these other, his former spy compatriots, want to know what he's up to. And if I had made a Picard series, just off the top of my head, right now, I would have made it more like Hopscotch. That's what I would have done. I would have done a galactic Hopscotch and um, you would have, you would. That's it, th there. You go, ladies and gentlemen. That's what. That's that's just off the top of my head right now. You gentle beings, you members of the post geek singularity community, whatever that means, hopscotch. But but imagine hopscotch as a Star Trek series with Jean Luc Picard in the Walter Matthau role, and you could revisit all these people. Um, that's kind of what I. That's what I. It's funny. I I don't know why I thought that, but. I love Hopscotch, and that's what I would do. If you haven't seen it, I mean, I'm not saying it's the best movie in the world, but it's pretty damn delightful. So I would definitely go check that out. Stubble McShave sends in a tip and says, I finally figured it out. J.J. Abrams, Kurtzman, and a few others from the production of the new Star Trek are watching all of your shows and are the reason for your dislikes. <laughs> oh, no, I think I think there's people, there's people that just dislike me. <laughs> And I, and I understand why, um, you know, I get it. There, there have been things I still need to atone for. I haven't been all, I haven't always been the best I can be. I've, I've, I owe people money probably. And I have things I've haven't done as well as I probably could have, but you know what? There are people that dislike my sunny disposition too. And that's okay. You know, I, I, I they should start. I know that there are people that, that hate the fact I have this YouTube channel. And I, I, I welcome anyone to do it. You know, the great thing about a YouTube channel is anybody can start one. And I'm, I'm absolutely, I'm in full agreement that uh, if you want to start your own YouTube channel, please submit it, start one, submit it to me. I will promote it on this channel. I mean, I, I like my fellow YouTubers. I watch them. You know, and and I think it's a great community. It's it's really like being at a science fiction convention. I, I, what I don't like is you might hate somebody, you might hate a YouTuber, but you know they. After all, they're out there. There, there's one thing you need to, I think, respect about at least in the fan community. Even if if you think you certain YouTubers might be toxic, and indeed they are, there are toxic YouTubers. Still, you know, for the most part, uh, I listen to most of the people in our community, um, especially that are talking about the, some of the same things. A lot of them are worth listening to, you know, and, and I, I, I find myself, I like being a part of this community. 
I've met a lot of great YouTubers. You know, I've, I've certainly, people have been ask, asking me to be on their shows, and I'll go on their shows, and I, I, for the most part, have had a very positive experience meeting people, and it's been a thrill. Like, you know, Dave Cullen, I've been watching Dave Cullen's videos for years, or I've been watching Midnight's Edge videos for a long time, and Gary Beekler at Nerdrotic, I'd, I'd watch him for a long time, and now that I, I, like, know these people and interact with them, and my interactions with all of them, Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers, my interactions with all of them have been, for the most part, very, very positive. And I feel like I've really been um, mecha random. I've been welcomed with open arms in a lot of places. And I think people understand where I'm coming from. Like, uh, my baseline with everybody is that we're fans. First and foremost, we're fans. And and we live in a time where, where it's never been a better time. Uh, you know, like Nanclus said in Star Trek VI, there's never been a better time. Um, I feel that way. There's never been a better time to be a fan. You know, we've got a global communications network that we can use whenever we want, and and we can share our enthusiasms. We can share. Look, fans have always talked about what they loved and what they hated. Uh, I've been going to science fiction conventions most of my life, and and what are we if we're not talking about what we love and hate? And uh, now we have uh, electronic forums that are global to do it. But at the end of the day, ultimately, you've got to smile about it all. And and when it comes to fan circles, uh. I think it's 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 more important to engage with people, and it's more important to 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 concentrate on what we love, and that's we love all of it. Science fiction, we're all imagination connoisseurs. We all love science fiction, fantasy, horror, comics, video games, action figures, model kits, flying model rockets, radio controlled planes. You know, one day, one day I'm going to build myself a radio controlled jet. I've always wanted to get into radio controlled planes. I never had. My boss at Warner Brothers, Bill Young, was telling me about how once at I don't, before i got there so this had to have been in the late 80s or something that a lot of the studio bosses the studio execs that were at his level they all got into like radio controlled planes and they were going to fly them out 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 like i don't know at point doom or something i don't know where but i always thought that was cool i i would love to have i would you know now there's you talk about uh joe manganiello plays D D. He's got his D D. I have a lot of Hollywood writer friends and producers that play D D, but I really wanted to live during a time when there was a, a cadre of Hollywood insiders that were radio controlled plane aficionados. Of course, that would have been expensive and it would have been frustrating to be young. It'd be frustrating now to get into radio controlled planes. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Anyway, um uh, oh, Richard said, sorry, phone went off. On a lighter note, I saw your reply to Rick Berman on Nerdrotic. Was he trolling or just being wistful? Oh, yes. Um, Rick Berman, who doesn't tweet very often, did tweet, how is everyone liking Picard? And I tweeted, I was one of the first people, it was like the first 10 people that tweeted back to him. I tweeted back to him, I said, I hope you're getting residuals because they've built an entire series around everything that you've produced. And I, I believe that. Some people, somebody came back and said, oh, he's he's consulting. Well, I haven't heard that. Maybe he is. It makes sense to me that he'd be consulting. Maybe Patrick Stewart insisted upon that, but I don't know. I don't know if he is or not. But there was a lot of very, very telling, <laughs> very telling tweets. Um yeah, you know, it's funny. I don't think Rick Berman would have ever allowed the scripts that they're making into Picard that he would never have let them buy. <laughs> he just wouldn't have. <laughs> but, you know, when you... What, what's really interesting is, is like, let's just take this week's... Let's just take this week's episode of Star Trek Picard. Okay, you've got Bruce Maddox that was introduced in Season 2 by Melinda Snodgrass. By the way, here's another thing that I think is great. So, according to the WGA... If you create a character, if you're a writer that creates a character, and that character is used again and appears on camera, you're, you as a writer are owed a character payment. It's a residual. And I, Melinda Snodgrass, who I got to know, uh, and also, by the way, you can't, you, can't not get a, you can't not have a crush on Melinda Snodgrass when you meet her because she, she's, such, she's such a delightful woman and she's smart and she's so funny and she's cute and and uh she wrote measure of men and i mean i got to go to a movie theater and see the extended version of measure of men when they had the fathom events with her like how great was that you know and i was instrumental in getting that extended version finished in hd it was actually my idea when i was in ken ross's office in new york city 
And they did it. And the Akutas found out there would only have to be three effect shots done. They were like, not hard to do. And it was so great. Well, she creates Bruce Maddox. And does anybody contact her? No. Does anybody tell her, yeah, you know that character that we made that actually was brought up again in Data's Day uh, and who's, who's had books written about him, David Max trilogy? We're just going to kill that guy. We're going to kill your character. But anyway, so if you think about it, so Rick Berman produces Star Trek, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager. You've got Bruce Maddox. You've got Seven of Nine. You've got Ikeb. It should, it should be, can't, why can't I say his name? Um, from multiple episodes of Voyager, you've got Picard himself, you know. So, so one episode of Picard is sequels to how many episodes of Rick Berman Star Trek? And the irony of it is Rick Berman, when you wrote, when you, when you wrote scripts for Next Gen, if you were going to write a, a, a spec script or if they were hiring, you, you, the last thing you do is write sequel episodes to things that happen. You'd write these standalone episodes. And, and yet, Star Trek Picard, is the, the whole show is based on concepts from Rick Berman's Star Trek. He should get a credit on the show. <laughs> he really should. He should get a created by credit. Or something, executive producer credit, because all of these concepts in the show have far more to do with the Star Trek that he created than that they have not created much out of whole cloth. Chateau Picard, which is now a hologram on a ship on uh, I mean on Rios's ship, that's right. Uh, it's just crazy, crazy. And and as far as I know, he's not given a credit on Star Trek Picard. Which is silly to me. But anyway, what are you going to say? What are you going to do? Uh, Thelma ML sent in a super chat. Why, thank you, Thelma. Do you believe these new Star Trek series are bringing up, bringing a new type of fan? I've recently visited several Picard pages, and I was surprised with the meanness of some fans. Oh, Thelma. Thelma, Thelma, Thelma. You have just hit the nail on the head. We live in an era where... Uh, Open disrespect and being mean are okay. It's now acceptable, especially online. Star Trek fans, I have been in fan circles for a long time. No, Look, I got in arguments with people, but nobody, I don't remember, maybe I've got my rose-colored glasses on, nobody was ever outright mean. I mean, when AOL was really huge in the 90s, I was on those Star Trek boards all the time, more than I, because it was it was a smorgasbord of fellow fans and their opinions, and we all loved it. It was like, oh my God, we're on the AOL Star Trek boards. Ron Moore would show up at some times, and you know, we would talk, and we, we would go into these deep dives into what Trek Yards is doing now. If you guys don't watch Trek Yards, Trek Yards, the two guys, uh, Captain Foley and Sam, um, you got to go, Stuart and Sam. The, the, it's Trek Yards. Trek Yards is exactly the kind of web. If I had that website when I was twelve, that would have been like the <laughs> the greatest thing in the world. I mean, they do these hour long shows where they do deep dives into every spaceship, and uh, it's just the best thing in the world. Uh, it's so great. And I love Trek Yards. And I love that Eagle Moss sends them a bunch of free stuff. So good good on them. But yes, fans are mean. And I don't get it. But I think that's because it's it's the post-Bart Simpson world that we live in. Kids grew up. Bart Simpson for the last 30 years has been around telling them that they're cooler than the adults. And yeah, I think meanness is a problem, especially in the post-Trump America. Uh, people are mean. I, I mean, I can't believe that our president, the president of the United States, got up and made fun of, of Parasite, <laughs> the best picture winner. Can you imagine, you know, you're a filmmaker like Bong Joon-ho, who is a world-class filmmaker. He's been making films for decades. He's made some films that I love, uh, Memories of Murder, um, The Host. I love those movies. Love Parasite too. But all you're doing is you're a filmmaker. You're a filmmaker and you're making movies. And the president of the United States at a rally gets up and basically says, you're undeserving. I mean, we live, that's the America of today. You're undeserving. Your movie did not deserve the accolades that it was getting. And not only that, our president's never even seen his movie. Our president doesn't even know who Bong Joon-ho is. The man wins 
Best Screenplay, Best Director, Best International Feature, and Best Film. I mean, no one's ever done that. He tied Walt Disney for being the one man who won the most awards at the one at one Oscars. And his country, you know, his fellow countrymen, imagine what that means in Korea. I've been to South Korea. What a what a lovely what a lovely country and the people there were just delightful. And they have such a respect and reverence for the United States because of what happened. When I was there, I was working on a documentary about uh, Major General John Singlob, uh, who's a hero and revered by the Korean people because of what he did in the Korean War. He's one of the founders of the CIA. And uh, I got to meet General Singlob and what, a, what an amazing guy. But can you imagine? And the President of the United States gets up and makes fun of that achievement, makes fun of your movie. You've never even seen it. Imagine what you would think, and imagine what your country would think. And I'm like, this is the problem. This is the problem that I have. Well, whatever you think of Trump's politics, the time and the effort it requires to make movies and to stick with it, and not only that, to have a decades-long career, and then to make a, a, an astonishing achievement, the fact that the United States, the very thing the United States stands for, which is somebody from a different country, a different way of life, a different world. Korea is a different world from the United States. Uh, comes over and our president, our president says that about, oh my God. I, 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 I'm like, why do we, why, why do we have this? What? what? And it, it's, I mean, I, I don't like to get political on this show, but that's an actual, that's an instance that I can point to. And I can say, this is why I could never vote for someone like Donald Trump to ever be in the White House again. Because saying something like that at a rally and listening to other Americans rail behind it and just is, is antithetical to what America is all about. I feel the same way about Star Trek. You know, I, I, we live in a world where our president would, would poo-poo an accomplishment of another human being who did something extraordinary. And uh, I feel that, that Star Trek, which was an extraordinary show, we're now watching the uh, what's extraordinary about it taken apart piece by piece. Oh, Tallulah. I think that's the cue, ladies and gentlemen, to end this show. Come here, Tallulah. Come here. Come here. Come on. Come on up. Okay, since you're going to bark, here, we're going to... You stay. Oh, no. Come on. Come on. Uh, so, so, ladies and gentlemen, apparently Tallulah has a story. Come here. Come here. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on up. You want a cookie? You want to come get it? If you're going to bark, come on. Okay, here we go. So Tallulah is here with me, and apparently she has a story to tell, and so does Gilbert. Uh, you see? Do you want to come here? Well, Gilbert's more reliable. Uh, every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear. All you have to do is, is listen. That's it. And, um, yeah, I want to thank... Uh, well, Gilbert, you want to stay? You yeah, buddy. You want to thank our moderators? I want to thank our moderators, the great, of course, Mayor Mike Bodden of Riverdale, Iowa. I want to thank, of course, Detective Jim Boyers. Uh, no, no, you can't. Gilbert loves paper towels. You can't eat that paper towel. No, Gilly. Uh, I want to thank Jim Boyers. I want to thank Greg Smith, who's building. Look at this. Look at this. I got them both. I want to thank Greg Smith for being a great moderator. And, of course, Jordy Lyons and Louis Yu for making this channel what it is. But most of all, I want to thank you guys. You imagination connoisseurs, guys, girls, gentle beings, however you identify. I want to thank you for being here and members of this, the post-geek singularity community. I want to thank you for sending in letters. If you want to send more in, please do so at the burnettwork.net website. And um, <laughs> Tallulah, Tallulah, Tallulah's going to start pressing buttons, aren't you? You crazy dog. Um, anyway, <laughs> I'm going to bring this, Observations episode 343, to an end. And... Uh, as you all know, I will tell you all that I'll be back here tomorrow. And to as always, have a better day. <laughs>